Welcome to Henley Royal Regatta 2020. Henley at home. It has to be said, this is very strange. The jacket, well, that's on the hook. There's no need for the tie this year and there's going to be no race programs or need for badges. It's going to be different, but we also hope it's going to be special and it's going to be fun. Tomorrow, Sunday, what would have been finals day, we've picked the best of the finals from the past five years and we're going to play them back to back. Today, Saturday, we're going to be interviewing some of the best athletes and coaches and performers from the past five years and running some races alongside them again, some that they were involved with, some incredibly famous moments from the Royal Regatta and getting them to talk about what it was like to be there in that moment. We'll have a chance to reflect on some record-breaking races and also we're going to be joined by Martin Cross and Jess Eddy to go through some of the hidden gems from our archive. The phrase has been used many times before about Henley, but did you ever think that Henley weekend was going to be like this? So now we're joined by Lisa Schienard, uh, Netherlands Sculler. Um, thank you so much for your time today. It's so lovely to see you. Uh, how is everything? How's the current situation in the Netherlands? Um, well, the current situation is actually considering pretty good. Uh, the lockdown is, is not as <laughs> high strung as it was. Um, we were allowed to to go for bike rides um and we weren't allowed to do that with loads of people so uh you, had, you pretty much had to to pick your partner and then that was your corona buddy now the situation has changed as well so we can even go into a bit bigger boats so we're now in a double uh which is uh, fun as well so uh, well, we, we missed the, the racing, but for the rest, it's actually pretty good. You can see in the screen below, we've got your uh, Henley race, your final. So this was 2016. You'd lost the, the final the previous, the previous year. Yeah, to Knafkova. Yeah. The first thing that struck yeah. me watching this back was how you're adjusting very late on, just before the go, you're still moving, you're still adjusting and changing the, the heading of the boat. Uh, I went out for the morning pedal and I found out my, that my, my pitch on my right hand uh, side was a bit off. So I wasn't too, I didn't feel too familiar. There was just a little bit of an off pitch on, the, on port side. So that was maybe one of the reasons I wasn't so comfortable in the start. That was pretty much it. So I think someone knocked the, the oarlock with something heavy or the boat fell over. I don't know. Um, so I was, I was pretty, yeah, the, 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 the morning pedal was sort of a little bit of, of trying to, to cope with the, the different feelings of the boat. Um, so maybe that was it, but it's also because you're really close to the temple. Um, and you have the, the current going on and your boat is just, the, the boats are passing and there was a bit of a wave going on. So you just want to have your boat as nice and tight as you, you can go from the start because you don't want to alter within your first couple of strokes. It's, it's always the different starting Henley with everything going on. That's just typical Henley. Yeah, that's, that's Henley. And I think that's the reason why I was just tapping a bit. So. So I, I was at least straight into the uh, going straight and, and, and wasn't bothering my opponent or myself by hitting the booms or anything. So. And, and how soon in a race? I mean, we can see you developing quite a nice lead, but in a single skull, even half a length of clear water or a length of clear water is almost nothing, especially at Henley. Yeah, I, well, I, I always try to, to stick to my own plan. And I, I always try to calculate what my opponent's probably going to do. So I have a couple of 
scenarios going in through my head. Uh, so especially if you, th this was the final, so you don't want to do anything stupid by, by really, really going hard from the start and then just crashing. Um, but you know the other girl's probably going to push pretty hard at the start. So you just try to, to do uh, what you think is best for her to, to go in, for, well, by going as fast from A to B as possible. And Henley, you have the current, it, it is more than 2,000 k, uh, 2000 meters, so you don't want to push yourself too hard because then it's really going to bite you at the end. And do you, have you got used over the years of racing at Henley to this sort of change of atmosphere? To begin with, it feels quite quiet and lots of leaves and trees and ducks, mm -hmm. and then slowly but surely it gets noisier and noisier and noisier as you go down the course. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the, the, the coolest parts about Henley is that you have a pretty much an oval of, of spectators. But I, I actually remember I just looked to the left. Maybe it was already a bit, bit before this part. And there's this girl I know, she ra uh, raced for Oxford. Um, and she was waving at me. She's like, hi. And I was already laughing because I know I was going to run this race. And I was really enjoying this this moment of going through the Stewart's enclosure. Um, but I was, oh no, I'm laughing. I can't be laughing. I haven't won yet. I still have to finish this race properly. So it's uh, it's, it's it's really cool that you're so close. So you can really see the, the facial expression of, of the people uh, lying next to the booms and just uh, cheering you on. And it's really cool. It's, it's, it's unlike anything else, pretty much. And you know, this was obviously in the middle of a season that you aimed and wanted to go to an Olympics. So this is no replacement for the Olympics, but was there a part of your mindset which was sort of readjusting to that? Winning, winning Henley is one of the coolest things you can, you can have. I, I know a couple of girls who never won and are really, really, um, um, they, 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 they really like winning Henley. That's, that's something that's, uh, that's pretty high on the bucket list of pretty much every rower, I guess. Um, so it didn't make up anything, but um, it was a really nice sort of cherry on top of the cake, I guess. You obviously were part of a sort of big Dutch squad that came and you've come, you know, many times. We're going to watch a, a, a quads race. You've been in a single, yeah. you've been in an eight at one point, you've been in the quad, you've been in the double. You know, yeah. how, how does that dynamic work with lots of athletes? Well, it's pretty cool because uh, there never used to be a, a proper sculling team before I entered. The last time we were uh, good enough to, to medal was back in 2000. Um, and that was the last time you medaled in a, in a sculling boat at the Olympics. When I entered and a couple of other girls entered the, the Dutch sculling team, we sort of made the quad and then it actually worked really well because we had this bunch of new girls who are actually really talented uh, as scholars as well. And since then it developed into a really, really high uh, level uh, sculling team, which is really cool. So we can switch girls within boats. We have pretty similar rowing techniques, some more than others. So some uh, doubles work better than other doubles, but everything, everybody, everybody can row with each other, which is uh really cool as well so we can make multiple quads multiple doubles and all have a high standard which is super super cool to to be able to do that as a country um so this race uh the the, the stroke seed was replaced by the previous bow seed and then uh, the this bow seed was put into the boat so they had to change uh, stroke um, uh, strokes and bows and then they had to race Henley, but they, this wasn't one of their best races, to be honest, because the, they, they had a bit of uh, back problems in this boat as well. I think we just did a little bit too much that season. And is there an additional factor with racing the British at Henley? Because this is obviously ah. what we feel is one of our top boats and suddenly the Dutch are a long way ahead and it's all a bit worrying, but maybe yeah, the British yeah. you know, on home water, we know something about Henley, but. I'm not sure that's yeah. true now with you coming so often. 
<laughs> yeah, well, the, most girls are actually really, um, they really love the atmosphere. The, and it's, it's only across the channel, so it isn't that far. Um, so it's, it's really cool to, to come by. And I, I think I know a couple of tricks of, of the, the Thames now. <laughs> and it's actually really interesting that they are on the the far ends of the state, the, and 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 they should have the, the the best water from now on, up until the finish line. And they still, the the girls on the the worst station are actually gaining. So that's that's pretty interesting. And is there a a mental thing around Henley because it's just one on one that you don't really have in six lanes? Oh, it's really different. So if you're behind, uh, normally there's always someone close to you who's pushing you. Um, and now it's if you're behind because someone did a really, really fast start. So you just that really have to keep to yourself. But you, you have the, the, the wash of the other boat, which is, of course, horrible. Uh, you really don't want to be in someone else's wash. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much a downside to it. Um, and the, the mental aspect, so you can really, um, yeah, try to 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 break someone early on in the race, so you have an easy pedal to the finish. Um, but some people just tend to really stick to you, and they won't let you go. And that's what actually happening here. The the English girls are well. This is this is our terrain. This is our Thames, and we don't want to get beaten by you girls. Um, so we'll just push until the line. And that, that makes up really, really interesting races, of course. So it's, it's, it's really different than a, a six lane uh, race, of course, yeah. And uh, this is 2019, were you all staying together? So you're in the same house or at least close together in town? Are you coming, you using the same routine with these girls? Actually, this time I wasn't. Uh, I was now in the same house with the uh, women's four, uh, the sweep girls, um, because that was just how they uh, did the housing. We were close to the... My neighbor was the lightweight single. Uh, she did the, the Dutch single as well, and the lightweight double who did the heavyweight disc donor challenge. Uh, so the... The, the lightweights and the four were really close to me and those girls were actually really far. And, and I've watched this race two or three times. This is now 10 strokes to go and you think there can only be one winner here. Yeah, they, they grit their teeth and they just push just a little bit harder, but it's so close on the finish. So if, if you see this one, you, you, you can't tell who actually won. So you really need to photo finish. No one knows. Yeah. No one knows. Yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> you just want to know. <laughs> Waiting for the photo to go. Well, and the other, the other problem is that Henley, yeah, here's the photo. Yeah. The other problem is there's no screen to look at. You have to be told. No, that's true. And, uh, well, you can look at the board or you can just hear the, the commentators telling you what, what's happening. Um, but it's, um, yeah, you, you can't see anything. But it, that, that's really similar to international racing as well, because if they had a photo finish, it takes time to get up on the screen. So the waiting is just horrible. You know, the Olympics has obviously been pushed back by a year for all of you guys. How mm -hmm. is that as a change of mindset? Is that in some ways a relief or is it, you know, another, another challenge? We didn't feel too comfortable because uh, France wasn't able to train outside. Spain wasn't able to train outside and all those things are coming in and you, you could see that it was going to get really, really bad in America as well. And, and that really didn't feel well because we were still able to go out in our singles, um, but it wasn't fair racing anymore. So if the Olympics would have continued in 2020, then it wouldn't have felt like a fair race because nobody had the same uh, um, uh, conditions to, to train in and to prepare. Yeah. Uh, so that we wouldn't have the same opportunities as other other countries and we were actually pretty blessed so uh, it would have been fair uh, so when they they first announced that they were going to postpone instead of cancel the olympics everybody felt really relieved and then everybody was okay but it's another year so that's and then you start thinking and you're 
um, by yourself quite a bit. So you have all the time in the world to think about stuff uh, and what kind of consequences will it have for you or your team. And a couple of girls are actually questioning if they could do this for another year because they were really happy to retire in, in August. So um, you really have to, to switch um, and then to, to motivate yourself to train really hard because you want to be as fit as you can be in, in an extra year from now. Um, so the, the cycle just got from four to five years and it's, that's pretty intense to, I, I think this, this winter will be the quite, quite difficult because we have an extra ERG test. We have an extra high altitude camp, which is pretty intense. And we have all those things we thought we had for the last time up until Tokyo. And then we have another two, two K again. test. We have, so we have all the, those things were pretty happy to to be done with uh we have to do them again so i think this winter will be quite grueling and now the weather is nice and you can do lots of volume and you don't mind too much um but this winter will be quite tough i guess for for everybody to really have your head in the game and um, and focus let's start this third race this is uh women's eights yeah. in the remenum this is Yale University from America and Nereus. I don't remember your university rowing or club rowing. How did you begin? Uh, I started um, as a student and it's called uh, Azer Teta. And it's, it's actually a really small club. It's, um, when I started, we only had 50 entries for, for that year uh, and it's with girls and boys together and only I guess a fourth of them are keen to to try and do a bit of race rowing instead of just drinking a bit of beer and training twice a week um, so that's that's really interesting about student clubs in the Netherlands three quarters of the club is actually financing the the race rowers who try to row elite uh, by drinking beer and doing parties and every two weeks or so during summer they go out in those practice boats we call them c4s i don't know how you call them it's yeah yeah the big keel, big, big, yeah. big boats who can't tip um and it's one of the races is as well who has the first beer of the day um and they are actually funding the the elite rowers of the netherlands so those girls are the elite of this club uh, Nerais. When you're rowing in an eight, how different is it? Again, the mindset, you've done single to eight, the two extremes at different stages of your career. What's mm. different about being middle of the race? You're buried now in the tactics, in the win, lose. This is all technical stuff. How do you keep your yeah. mind in the right place in an eight? Uh, I, I think rowing in an eight is, is way more difficult than rowing the single. Uh, because once you lose momentum, you can't get a grip. And then there has to happen something really magical to 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 change momentum. And it's it's and in the singles just you decide to push harder and that's it, that's enough. <laughs> or you decide to really put put your head down and just invest and, and go for it. And in the eight that's it's just not enough. It's the, the coxswain is so important to to, to get everybody in the same rhythm and the same groove and the same momentum. And now they're, they're going into stewards and are actually losing their momentum. And I just talked to the, the coxswain and she said, I was screaming so loud to get those girls, but it was, it was, it was more than a 2k race and we were ahead at the 2k, but we were really, really far down <laughs> at the finish of Henley. So the, yeah, the, they, they were really struggling at this point to um, to keep it together. It's a one hundred. It's extra one hundred and twelve meters. Yeah, and the the current going against you that that's not helping either. Um, but um, yeah, so they're losing their momentum, and then I can imagine if you're on the yield boat, you, you're just flying at the moment. You feel every every couple of strokes, you you get an extra. Uh, guy from the other boat so it, it, it gives you pretty much wings and you fly over those girls and to 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 go against it in an eight that's so so difficult i i, I never really 
understood the proper proper working A to be air, to be honest. So um, no, me neither. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 something else entirely. Yeah, and they're I love struggling. That. So the quintessential they're... Henley view in the sunshine yeah. on the river, you know, hard racing. We yeah. all miss it so desperately this summer. Dying. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We we miss racing as well. It's it's yeah. the, the best thing about rowing, pretty much. So uh, everybody can train. They are absolutely at a standstill. Yeah, they just. She told me that the other girls were gaining, of course, but they were just losing speeds. Just they they were pretty much Once doing a gone, light pedal gone. at at. They were doing light pedal at stroke thirty nine or so, so uh, yeah, they they were they were cut at the, at the end. They were just so tired. During Henley at home, we're going to have regular intervals to look back at some of the amazing records that have been broken in the last five years. This is in the Town Challenge Cup, and appropriately enough, it includes Hollandia Row Club. the Town Challenge Cup. We have Hollandia from the Netherlands on the left-hand side of your screen, Chinese national rowing team from China on the right. And this is one that everyone's been looking forward to seeing because it's going to be very hard to call. Both crews off to a decent start. Hollandia a little bit too far to the left for my liking. You'd be worrying about the oars clipping those boys. Umpire having a quick look to make sure they're not going to be in danger. Well, it's interesting to see this, isn't it? We've not seen the Chinese fall under pressure in this regatta in this way yet. The Chinese currently being led by a battle length by the uh, Dutch women's four. Pretty essential for the Chinese at this point in the race to make sure that they're into a strong rhythm that they can sustain, but they've got to get their boat moving. And I think this is where, if you're in the Dutch women's four, you capitalise on that, don't you? You've seen them having to correct the steering. That's going to slow the boat quite a bit. They look really good, don't they? That's just really simple, strong rowing that we expect from the Dutch women. Chinese struggling a bit with being down. They're now rowing in the wake of their opponents. They're having to contend with lumpier water here on the Henley stretch. And uh, despite the experience they've had through this week of demolishing every other opponent, it looks like the Chinese are facing a defeat. But the Dutch looking really good from above I mean, there. If you want to know how to row a Coxus for man, women, girl, boy, this is the way to look at doing it. No disturbance really smooth, just pushing the boat along and getting that return. What I love about the Coxes 4, you don't have a weight of a cox to slow you down, so the run between strokes, which is a key part of the boat speed, is something that you can absolutely maximise. And it's wonderful to see the way these guys are propelling their boat as they come to the stewards' enclosure. They're going to be appreciated by the huge crowds we've got on the final day. 4 is the ultimate boat in terms of, I think, run and, and leverage, and it just should feel absolutely like silk, and that's how it looks here in this Dutch boat. It looks really unfussy what they're doing and they're just really sympathetic to that boat and letting it run on each stroke. Yeah, it's a wonderful display of Cox's Falls rowing by these women from Hollandia coming into the final few strokes of the race in front of the grandstand. Applause all round for a great final well rowed by the Dutch. The Chinese came here and they looked pretty invincible through the competition until, until they met these class, world-class opponents. They're going to meet again later in the season. And the Dutch women, victors in the Town Challenge Cup. We're going to take a second little interlude now. We've asked Martin Cross and Jess Eddy, two of our Henley commentators, to pour over the video archive. And they've come up with a couple of races that you might have missed, which are, in their own way, extraordinary. Here's Martin and Jess with two of their hidden gems. Hi, I'm Martin Cross. Hi, I'm Jess Eddy. And uh, we've chosen some fantastic races to show you these hidden gems. First up is the Temple Challenge Cup from Friday of 2015 between Oxford Brooks University A crew on the left of your picture and uh, the students from Neerhouse Holland on the right of your picture. And Jess, this is just such a fantastic race, chosen it for so many reasons. Few people called this potentially the race of the regatta. They were both seeded in this event, the Temple, Brooks on the far side there and Neerhouse closest to us. And uh, really a bit unlucky they didn't meet in the final, but this is just a race in perfect conditions, really fast. I love to watch the way that near us roads, Jess. 
Yeah, I mean, this really was the race of, of, of the regatta for the, the temple because um, they had some of the fastest times. I think they're about to get uh, uh, equal the record to the barrier. Um, and these are two of the top crews in, in the event. So it's we picked this because it's an incredibly tight one. Yeah, Oxford Brook's got such a fantastic program on the far side. And, and you know, they are so dominant now at Henley. And there's quite a few uh, of the lads in there that will go on to win. The, the Temple win the ladies' plate at Henley. You see a great little shot there from the, the hill at the back. Henley, iconic shot, really. But let's take a look at this nearest crew. That they, They've got some coaching from Will van der Witt and Diederik Simon, the Atlanta gold medalist from the Dutch eight, who really did leave a signature mark on that Olympic Games as a fantastic way to row. And this crew is so smooth, so relaxed, really quick out. And that was a 144 to the barrier, which they equaled the record, which was held by Harvard and Cal. So really storming fast, and Brooks couldn't quite live with that pace. Yeah, I mean, this crew exemplifies everything you'd expect from a Dutch crew. They're renowned worldwide for that, that low, in the, low in the shoulder, long, silky strokes. And it's almost a little bit opposite to the aggression that you see from the Oxford boat. And that's why they've managed to slip almost a length here by the barrier. Yeah, just a very easy flow forwards, quite long as well. And uh, I think really brilliantly stroked by Frick Roberts. Roberts. He looks really young in the stroke seat there. You see quite a few of these uh, Dutch oarsmen now around on the international circuits in the World Championships of 2019. And uh, there you see Brooks just pulling back. It's just really adding to the spice of this race because they equaled the record through to Fawley. did a 257, Jess. But now the call's going out from the Brooks Cox, Harry Brightmore, got to really push back on those flying Dutchmen. Well, you're going to hear it a lot, but this one-on-one -on -one racing, you have to stay in touch, and that's what Brooks have done here. They've, they've really held on to Neeraus, and they've not let them move through the middle part of this race now. And that's what makes them the, the kind of club and the crew they are. They're feisty rowers. But cutting to this Neeraus crew, we can see again how low they are on the shoulders. Nothing's going upwards. It's all going into the boat to go horizontally. Yeah, and that's the hallmark of these crews. It's the same with the crew that came over the, the, the following year, the 2016, that raced in the ladies and got disqualified. There are, uh, what, four of this crew raced in that crew in 2016, and they had a similar style. But you can see that Brooks just still pushing a little look there from uh, Morgan Bold in the Brooks stroke, just to see where those Dutch are. And Brooks will know they have a charge at this race, but uh, at the moment, the Dutch have covered everything that Brooks have got to offer. Yeah, and I mean, you never like your crew looking out, but in this situation, you might need your bowman to look across and say, they're still there, hold on to them. And that's exactly what he just did. Yeah, and the wolf right up in the bows of the nearest eight there. I love the look on the faces. They don't really look as if they're working flat out, which of course they are. And there's an awful lot of pain going on through the legs and so on. But the expressionless in the, in the faces kind of shows you just how fluid they are on the way forward. Yeah, they used to be the yeah, most annoying to nation to the race, the Dutch, because it looked effortless and that kind of that silky smooth rowing. But they always managed to go pretty fast. So it's, it's really fast. impressive to see so here in this new house crew. Yeah, coming up to yeah, the up grandstand to here the grandstand on the here. Friday, that on iconic Friday, shot of the church in the background. The Brooks the coming background. right back Brooks into it now. Right back into it and near us are being called to do something extra special as we come up to the public grandstand there. And probably just wandering about 300 metres to go from here, Jess. Yep, and this is Brooks' last chance. He's having a call. This is why the bowman's looking over. He's saying, go now. You've got to go now, otherwise you can't leave it too late. And remember, they've got an extra 100 metres to an international race. 2,112 metres, so they have got that extra bit of mileage to sprint. And here they come, they're mounting the charge. Yeah, you see Morgan Bolding going through the gears, Henry Swarbrick behind him, James Stanhope, the two lads from Hampton, really winding it up, and then Gibbs, Aldridge, Glover, Hall and Reeves, stuffing it in there, aren't they? And this is where we're going to get a fantastic finish. And uh, near us have been really and, uh, pushed on. You look really across from the Bowman, Reeves and Brooks as they come towards the finish line. And Brooks are closing, closing. Brooks are closing, closing. They're pushing right up to the near us too, but they've managed to keep their bows ahead. 
Yeah, near us just coming yeah, through to the visit. Isn't it great to watch this fantastic race and Brooks surging towards the end? And near us, you see, are coming up towards the line. It's oh so close though, isn't it? Brooks nearly got that in the charge at the end. And that time, it was just lightning quick. I think they beat the previous record by about something like seven or eight, nine seconds. Doing confetti. Yeah, the near house cocks splashing the water with her arms. The water with that was a lightning fast race. That was a lightning fast race. And that was a big race for them. That, that near us crew went on to win, yeah, to win the temple to win, um, to win and, the and the didn't have anyone of that caliber the rest of the weekend for them. So incredible the race and hats off to both crews. And hats off to both crews. Yeah. So now we'll be going to the Diamond Jubilees race, the junior women's quads from 2016, Gloucester Hartbury versus Henley. Now this is day three and they've both come across some pretty steep competition already. But this is probably one of the, the, the races of the entire regatta. So we've, we've picked this because these are two powerhouses in junior women's quads. Gloucester Hartbury have won this event four times in the past eight years. And we're cutting to about halfway now to see both crews just about level. But Gloucester Hartbury about half length behind, Martin. Yeah, Gloucester Hartbury in the yellow boat and uh, Henley Rowing Club on their local water in the white boat. And what I love about this matchup is that these guys have been racing each other in, in fours with one blade each from rowing events, just uh, coming up to Henley Regatta at uh, National Schools and Women's Henley. Traded results and Henley Rowing Club with a pretty decent three quarters of a length lead. That's the crew nearest us. And, you know, they've got to be feeling great at this stage of the race because they've got a lead on, on the favourites who've won it in the last two years, 2014 and 2015. And it doesn't get much better than that, does it? You know, the favourites are under real pressure. They've still got contact. But these four women from Henley Rowing Club, Morgan K. Pearson and Georgie Robinson Ranger in the stroke seat are really sticking it to the women from Gloucester. Yeah, and they're quite far down the course now, and the Gloucester Hartbury crew is seeing a length behind. I agree. Henley must feel quite comfortable right now on their home water, leading this crew that's beaten them all year in a four. But maybe this is the turning point now, and Gloucester Hartbury have got that belief and got that caliber of athlete. You're looking at a crew here who have many, many international races behind them and have gone on to great things. A lot of, a lot of the girls are now in the national teams or big programs, universities. So um, they um, are starting to draw level here as we come through Remenham. That's Lawrence, Russell, Adamson and Webb going down the boat. Lawrence in the stroke seat from the Gloucester crew. And uh, I think, you know, if you haven't moved away at this stage of the race, if, if Gloucester have still got the overlap, you know, that then you really start to ask yourself questions in the Henley boat. You know, can we maintain it? A slightest move from Gloucester, perhaps put the psychological yeah, pressure on. One thing I'm going to draw your attention to is the way these Gloucester girls are pushing their legs in time with the hull. Um, Henley doing it very well, but it'll cut to Gloucester in a second, and you can really see their connection. Their legs are pushing that hull, and there's very little else happening. Um, and I think that's the reason why you're going to see in a second they're going to really start pushing up on the Henley crew, and it's, it's exemplary rowing. Yeah, I think they've got to take a lot of confidence. Yeah. The grandstand's a little bit empty. That's a good, sh good spot, Jess. Actually, the cohesion is beautiful in that Gloucester crew, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, it's I like know. them. You've got um, Zoe Adamson rowing in that boat there. He went on to win the Junior Worlds in the double the next year. So they're very, very experienced and high-caliber athletes. And look at them right now. They pull right back on Henley through the enclosures. I mean, we love to see these races, don't we, where one crew leads out and the other crew comes right back. And this is Gloucester Rowing Club just moving straight back. You've got a, a view of that fantastic sweep the Gloucester girls have. Really clean off the finish, the crew on the right of your picture. It's the local women from Henley on the left. And Henley did have that lead, but now it's all change. Coming up to the last 300 metres. Yeah, it looks hard work for the Henley girls now, whereas the Gloucester Hartbury crew really look in sync and their boat is just flying along right now. And that feeling of getting kind of sucked through and, and passing through a crew next to you is incredible. So they're, um, they're probably absolutely laughing here. They've taken a hell of a lot out in the last uh, 300 metres or so, haven't they? I mean, they, they went from being sort of three quarters of a length down to being nearly clear water up against Henley. That was, a, that was an awesome move. A lot of it through technique. 
Yeah, and this crew go on to beat Headington in the final, so they all get to go home with a, another win for Gloucester Hartbury from Mr. Regatta. Third win in a row for the women from Gloucester. And uh, Henley, that had led throughout, just couldn't hang on when Gloucester started that surge. And uh, those are the races we love to see at Henley, where you've got a leader put under pressure and the final few hundred metres sees the race begin again. And Gloucester really took their chances on that one. Yeah, if you've got any junior girls or boys watching, that's how to row a junior quad. Have a look at it, watch it over, and that could be you in the future Henleys. So we're back with Lisa Sheenard. We've got one more race to watch, and this is the Diamond Jubilee. So this is junior girls in the quads. This is Latimer and a German club, Kreuzgasse. Lisa, I, I think one of the magical things about Henley is the combination of junior athletes and senior athletes you know to have uh, under 18s racing almost on the same track at the different uh, you know but sometimes actually against one another but but yep. it's it's that broad range of ages at henley in the boat tents in the changing rooms on the b b marshals you know it's all all mixed in uh, we stayed over at a, a guest house and uh, the son of of our family uh, he was rowing at henley uh, club yeah. And he was trying to go into Henley, uh, into the boat, was going to Henley, but they didn't qualify, they weren't fast enough. And so he was really keen on, on improving, so he, he would make it into Henley one time. And um, last year, I actually saw him again, and he was racing the, the boys squad, and they made the final, and he was so, he was so sad because they lost the final. But... I told him, well, two years ago, you were just really, really happy to actually go to Henley. You know, you're racing yeah, the finals. Yeah. So how cool is that? Uh, so it's it's a sort of a boys and girls dream to to race Henley as as a junior, which is so cool. And you can you can be on the same water as your your heroes and the people you look up to, and maybe try to beat at one point in your career. Um, and that's that's so cool to to be to be able to and to to just see how they approach their sport and what you can learn or if you're already doing it really well then that's fine as well and who was the big influence to you when you first started i know you were you weren't under 18 when you first started but it must have been more than beer and big boats uh well when i started i was drinking more beer than i was rowing but uh no once i got actually excited about rowing I, I didn't know anything about it i just loved the sport at the time that was 2012 2011 that i was really looking into sculling um so it was actually catherine granger and anna watkins who were just pretty much dominating the the field and it was pretty fun because i saw catherine once at, uh, at henley and I, I told her that she was uh, sort of my uh, the, the the boat to to watch to improve and she was so honored because of that there wasn't too much of one person who was really the one to look up to but i i, I remember those names and and seeing them skull and i thought wow that's that's pretty awesome what sort of challenge maybe it's an additional challenge is henley for a junior athlete i mean you're going to have to imagine what it's like for these girls what what is that pinnacle going to be like for them is if, if you win that race, that's the, the most important race to win. And Henley is actually sort of getting there almost. So even if you only get there um, on Wednesday and then you get knocked out, you still were able to go to Henley because you deserved it. Uh, this Maybe girl is watching the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's close. It's a great race. Yeah. It's a great race. Because they were far ahead. Because, but the other... The other station is, is they're, they're, they're now having advantage of the current. So, you know, you have to push harder to, to get them away from you. So that's always, um, yeah, they, they are, they're putting their head down and so just pushing as hard as they can. Again, another one, and they got no idea who's won. Yeah, I know. It's the, the English girls. <laughs> So maybe as we come to the end of our time, uh, a controversial question. What could Henley do better? 
they now have opened up the, the women's development uh, aids as well. And that's, that's, I think that that's really cool for girls because the Ramanam is such a high level. You race against Australia yeah. or England or the Netherlands or America. And it's, it's, you, you can't go there and think, hmm, I might win if you're a student club. Um, so I think loads of girls will be really keen to, to join Henley and, and be able to, to win uh, uh, the, the student aid. Lisa, look, thank you for your time again. It's been really wonderful spending time with you, going back over some Henley memories. Uh, good luck for the rest of the summer, all this isolated training, and of course, the best of luck for the challenge for Tokyo 21. Uh, thanks so much for having me, and uh, to sort of still keep the, the Henley vibe going, even though it's, it's not through racing. And um, well, yeah, well, we'll, we'll see if ha what happens uh, upcoming year, but uh, we hope to see you guys soon and uh, during races. Thank you. We're going to take a short break now. We'll be back with Henley at home in a couple of minutes.
Our next guest for Henley at Home is GB Coxon, Phelan Hill, world champion, Olympic champion. Welcome, Phelan. Hey, Matt. Good to see you. We're going to have a proper talk later, but for now, let's go straight in at the deep end. And this is obviously the Grand Challenge Cup final for 2015. Let's talk a little bit about the run-in because Britain versus Germany was a staple race for that full Olympiad between London 2012 and Rio 2016. I mean, I spent my whole international career racing the Germans. Uh, I mean, they've got outstanding form in the men's A. They, they know how to win. They know how to dominate. Uh, so it's been a real tussle over the years. I think my first rowing Olympiad, I was, I was always a bridesmaid and never the bride. Uh, luckily, the second Olympiad, we, we changed that round. It was, it was a huge year for us. You know, it's going into Olympic qualification. Um, we'd already raced the Germans twice a season. First time at Europeans where, where we lost. And then we just beat them by a narrow margin in Varese. That year in Henley, there was always a little bit in the back of my mind as well. Potentially, this could be my last Henley uh, competing internationally uh, and, and racing at the Grand. Um, and, and we were the world champions. They were Olympic champions. So there was so much on it. There was so much excitement around it. And I think probably I look back at my career and this definitely raises probably top three, top five, five races I've, I've ever been part of. It, it's a... It's a real magical thing, and I think as well, it's you can't get over the difference competing in just two of you compared to being like a multi-lane. I think the intensity of competition just increases so much when there's just the two of you there. You know, it's a real duel, and then add to that, it's our biggest rivals who who are an awesome crew. You know probably one of the standout crews in the history of rowing when it comes to men's eight. So, yeah, it was it was a big moment. And it's unmistakable watching the Grand, particularly with the Germans, particularly with a match uh, that this is, that the coxing is an additional role, that, that it's, you tend to come out in the middle and almost have a sort of quiet side tussle about where you're steering. Henley is so daunting I think from a coxing perspective because you've got the booms and you know it's quite easy you can have you know ripples in the water particularly when it comes to the weekend there's so much activity there's so much support you've got bounce chop wind it's quite easy just for those boats to just get pushed around and move so you really do have to be on your top game here I'm watching this race thinking I think Phelan's washing them down here I think and I don't think you were ever <laughs> warned. I'm not sure you deserve to be warned. I'm I'm confused by where they're putting their coxswain is putting their boat here. It's one of those things. It is it is really challenging. I I have to say at, at, at this point in the past, I think probably when I was a little bit younger and and maybe a little bit more naive, there was always this thing. Oh yeah, you get up in front and you you do a little bit of washing down and you can play a little bit of games. Um, I think I, I think this time. We were just so focused on our own boat. For me personally, I was just like, I want to just take take the best lane, best line, uh, not get involved in too much of the games. And actually, I, I do think at this point, I, I, I felt that I was holding a good line throughout. Um, yeah, and perhaps like the Germans did sort of like move around a little bit. You know, I, I think possibly that helps with just having a bit of home experience. You understand how how the hull just moves at certain points. You know when you have the gaps in the booms, you, you get that little bit of extra bounce and that. You also know that through the middle chunk as well, particularly on our side, our station, you know you're going to be a little bit, well, first first you're in the stream and then you move out the stream and then you come back in, you know, to the stream. So you know there's all those sort of like subtle movements around the hull that you have to sort of like prepare for. You for the grand, 3 o'clock, 3.30 on a Sunday afternoon, you've got to be preparing your crew in almost any race you're doing at this level for the noise. They're going to be unlikely to hear everything you say from here on in. I, I don't think you get a crowd bigger than this anywhere I've ever raced um, all the way down the course. We, we actually, it was something that Mo picked up on, as he said that actually back in 2010, uh, he could hardly hear me. So actually through the 
through the second Olympiad when um, we were preparing for Henley, I had actually spoken to MPAC and we actually installed an extra mic um, speaker in the hull to sort of like compensate for that a little bit more. These guys are sort of like the, the best guys in the world. They're very professional. We have a race plan that we've rehearsed and we've drilled over time. We've visualized, we've talked about it. We know at key markers, you know, as you come into come into stewards, you've got about 300 meters. You know, then as you come up to the progress board, there's about 150 meters to go. So these are all t key markers that we know in the back of our mind. So we know even if they can't hear, there's that like very simple cue that they know. And that celebration where you're standing up, that's a high tariff maneuver that can go quite <laughs> badly wrong. Uh, yeah, it, it could go very wrong. Maybe, maybe that would have made for a better video. I think there was a lot of relief and emotion. Henley is such a massive thing. There's so many emotions. I think the, the intensity which goes with it is, is, is on another level. You, you're coming on the outside of the course and you're coming down the middle of the course. You're having to cut across the course. You've got the great Elvis launch going along by the side. You've got loads of other traffic. You know, you don't have that clear, clean warm-up zone. There's, there's so many uncontrollables before you even get to the start. Um, so, so that pressure just mounts all the time. So probably emotions of the time probably got over me at that point. I think I've only ever done that, that maneuver once more. And I think that was the Olympic final. So, <laughs> And something particular to Henley with the margin. I mean, you were unlikely to get anything like that margin in any other, certainly in a six boat race. I've never had that margin ever again against the Germans. Um, and, you know, it, it's one of those, I, I always look at it a little bit because it's one-on-one. -on -one. You're like on a, a bit of string of elastic. You go off, you tussle, you tussle. The, the elastic band stretches a little bit. And then all of a sudden, it just gets to a point where the band snaps. And then, and, and then you can just sort of like hopefully move away. You, because you know it's just that one-on-one -on -one duel when we were up, one of the things we wanted to do was just then like twist the knife and, you know, keep going and, and just really send a message. You know, a, a length wasn't enough. So this is a double skulls race uh, after the end of your career, but Groom and Beaumont and the O'Donovans. And how are you as a Henley spectator since your career? How, how do you enjoy watching other people do it as you're uh, in the enclosures? When, when we were in the team, we were really, really strict and disciplined. Um, I used to come for training and I'd go home each day. And, and so I never really got to experience Henley for about 10 years. Uh, and particularly because, you know, if, if we were in the final, we would be not racing till three o'clock. So by the time you've raced, got changed, it's all over. Um, and if we had been knocked out, on the Saturday or something, Jürgen would be very adamant that we'd be training again on Sunday. So um, there, there wasn't really much time to enjoy it when we were there. Um, so I probably like, I have to say like initially, it was nice to get out there, see it all, um, be part of the crowd, see friends, see family. Um, but when it comes to racing and, you know, you get the big races coming down, you see sort of like ladies play, you see the ground coming down, you see sort of like the Thames, any of those races, you have that, you know, inkling that um, you want to be out there. Although I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I've still got the, the energy or the appetite to, to do like what is, um, you know, it's, you know, that's like day to day grind of training. It's 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 a really hard mentality to have. And, you know, what what I see the guys deliver on a day to day basis still is is absolutely amazing and awesome. And hats off full credit to them. How well do you know these guys? I'm particularly thinking about the Brits. Obviously, Ang Angus and Jack, I know really well. Um, really, really great scholars. I think probably sort of like a couple of the best two um, boat movers in the team. And then actually the, the Irish boys, I, I got to know really well in Rio. Um, so obviously the Irish team's a little bit smaller. I think, you know, sort of like post-racing, everyone joins together. I really love that. Um, so know them well, and they are um, absolute tenacious racers. I'd probably say, you know, at this point in time, back in 2018, these, these two doubles were sort of like some of the best in the world. 
the lightweights seemingly, certainly at an Olympic level in the next four years, coming to an end. The boat classes will simply not be represented at the Olympics. Where are you on that, on that decision? Uh, I have to say it's a real shame. Um, I, I, I think lightweight racing is some of the best racing around. Um, I was always, you know, I, it, it, is, it is a tough one. Um, you know, I, I understand originally when lightweight was brought in, it was to try and in, increase like the diversity in the range of crews. I still think it's probably dominated by similar crews. Um, but just purely from a racing purist perspective, um, I, I, I really miss lightweight racing. I think lightweight's four is some of the best racing you'll ever see. Um, I think because of the the weight, um, you get very very close racing. I I do think it's it's a real shame that we've just lost that purely from a, a, a racing perspective. I used to love it when it's close and you still, you know, the the Simon is still coming into the last two fifty, last five hundred. You know, who's actually going to win this? And you've got three or four crews going tussle to tussle, probably rating about forty plus as well now, which is sort of like a standard. Um, it, 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 it can make it for really, really interesting. And a sort of classic challenge between a heavyweight crew and a lightweight crew, but maybe somewhere like Henley, I mean, it's happened in the past where the lightweights can get the upper hand because of those yeah. uncontrollables you were talking about. You know, I think as we've touched on previously a bit, Matt, you know, there's so much psychology at play um, that actually... It's a really difficult situation being like, an, I imagine for like Jack and Angus, in a way, there's, there's an expectation you should win. So if, if you do win, it's like, yeah, you should win. You're, you're a heavyweight double. And then, you know, if you don't win, then the, the, the questions are asked a little bit. But if you don't execute your plan off the start and all of a sudden, you know, you're coming through the barrier, you're coming through 40 and it's still neck and neck, then, then it's sort of like, you have those questions in the back of the mind is what's going on here? What, what should happen? And you know what lightweights are like, they're so tenacious, you know, you give them a little bit of a sniff, they're all over you. They're attacking. They don't have that fear of like rating high. They will just go and go and go They're You know, they've got that real terrier mentality. So yeah, you know, anything can quite happen if you do give them a sniff. I think, you know, here Angus and Jack have done a, a great job through that. Through, through that middle half almost just to close the door um but you know fair play to the irish here you can still see that they're going hard they they won't give up so the next race is between london rowing club and a new zealand club wanganui it gives us a chance to talk about your early rowing experience how did you get started feeling well one i love this race this is a great race but um without my time at london i would have never progressed any further and 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 actually I look back like probably the biggest defining moment for me was actually winning um the Thames Cup with with London club rowing for me sort of like changed it you know obviously you do a bit at school you do a bit of university but um you know competing for London and competing in Thames Cup and winning it was was like a really defining moment and and actually gave me a lot of belief like I think any any club dream like when you're at a club the the only dream you ever have is to get a red box it's it's like the red box dream it it it's something you know really magical and I remember when I was at London Rowing Club there were a few guys still training who were won you know the Thames Cup a few years before and you know really looked up to them like these are amazing people they, they they've managed to get a red bot um you know it it was something like totally awesome to dream about and I, I think probably I spent three years at London just dreaming of winning Henley <laughs> and and actually the the club racing at Henley is really special because you you do go on a really big journey it's like nothing else you know you sort of like we used to arrive on Sunday, stay um, accommodation, normally a really lovely family just outside of Henley. And then, you know, 
you would be there training every day and then it would be just like this campaign you know race wednesday race thursday friday you know the the club guys who i raced with in in 2006 you know we're we're still really good friends you know we still whatsapp each other every day it's it's probably you know it's 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 a real magical moment you you build bonds that you sort of like keep for life and um yeah really really special and would there be a moment in the the london uh ecosystem where the crews were announced for henley or the plan and you're hoping that London are going to do an eight for the Thames, maybe, but produce fantastic Y-fold fours year after year after year from yeah. decades before up to the present day. You just have to do the best. And then whatever boat you end in, you just have to enjoy the moment and do the best that you can. And, and we've seen in previous years as well with London, you know, in, in 2004, they had a top Y-fold, but they also had an eight and they, they, they won both. So, um, nothing nothing is impossible and with henley being henley you've just got to fight all the way through to the finish line and this is what these two crews did so brilliantly i think this is possibly one of the closest races i've ever seen in my life um i know i know at london we always train for sprint finishes um but i mean this was this was tighter than you could could ever imagine and and at this point you would always just say actually um you know the crew on the inside is always going to be up for it but fair play to the the kiwi crew here actually going for it and actually initially i thought they actually got it on the surge but um there's probably a little bit of camera angle there but wow that that is one tight race i feel sorry for those guys from new zealand coming all the way over <laughs> to lose by that That's margin Henley. really really tight I know, tough. <laughs> now we're going to take another short break to watch another record-breaking race. This is from the King's Cup, the Australian Defence Force versus the Bundeswehr. German armed forces on the left of our shot against the Australian armed forces on the right. Plenty of power, plenty of togetherness. I saw the German crew, they're really big, strong men in the middle of that boat. Now for the Australian crew, have, there's some stories to tell about the Australian crew that we'll get into later, but at the moment they're looking pretty much neck and neck coming along Temple Island. Yeah, good start, very good rowing. And the Germans very, very clean there you know, on the Barcher station against the Australian crew here on the Buckingham station. And they're, they're just slightly moving away because they've got that cleaner finish, lot slightly longer, cleaner at the finish, and now they're moving away. Well, that is the Bundeswehr Arcta on the right of our shot, up against the Australian armed forces on the left of our picture. And as we said, the crew in 1919 from Australia won the King's Cup. They took it back to Australia as the crew from Germany really wandering off their station. And I think Sarah Winkler, she went for a flag once. Um, she tried to push them back towards their station. She's going to want to see Petty Officer Caroline Mayer in the coxing seat of the German 8 respond. Um, and uh, at the moment, she seems happy with the position of these two crews coming through poorly through halfway. But the Australians are coming back, Greg. They're coming I back right now. The Australians are coming back. The Australians are looking like they're pushing in this third quarter. Third quarter of the race, they're up at 39 strokes a minute. The Germans at 38 strokes a minute. So this one is certainly not done yet. But now the technique's going to show, have the Germans been efficient enough that they've got about half a boat length? They had a bigger lead before. The Australian crew are trying to come back on terms. And if I was in the boat, I'd be saying, don't wait. Don't wait. You have to go for it now. You can't wait for the last 100 metres. You have to start to move now. Both crews at about 38 strokes a minute. And the Australian crew have not been able to move from that half length uh, overlap that they got, the German 8 have been able to open up this gap again and push it back towards pretty much a full length with the Australians hanging on to try and keep an overlap. This is a great race, but also Greg, it's a, a great example of how you row. You have to dare to put everything on the line at the beginning. Um, and then just hold that speed. Well, there was strength and power from the German crew. They got the boat up to speed quickly. They got away well, and they crossed the line here, just about a length ahead of the crew from Australia.
Time now to go back to Jess and Martin with two more absolutely barnstorming races that you might have missed. Hello and welcome back. Now we have a humding of a race for you in the Princess Royal Challenge Cup, the women's singles. And we have Alice Bartz here of Agecroft versus Imogen Grant of Cambridge, both senior GB rowers. One lightweight, one heavyweight. Let's see how this goes down. Lots on the left here picture in the yellow boat and Imogen Grant were just looking there in the colours of Cambridge University Boat Club. On the right of your picture in the white boat, easy to spot them apart, but there was hardly any distance between them throughout the whole of this race, Jess. Yeah, it's an absolute corker. And um, one, one really special thing is they're both in the same team together, but one is the lightweight sculler and one is the heavyweight sculler. And I think it shows you the kind of the caliber we've got in the team, but also how close it is between lightweights and heavyweights. That, that kind of weight um, advantage or disadvantage really comes into play. Uh, Alice is fairly junior in this, in this um, field of sculling, so um, she knew she had to take it to Imogen, who was very fast and actually went on to become world and 23 champion in the singles. So um, really, really high caliber of row here and neck and neck. Yeah, it is. The weight difference is it's quite striking between these two athletes. I think I saw that um, Alice Bartz, we see her there, weighed in at around about 13 and a half stone and Imogen Grant just nine stone three. And, uh, you know, we, we spoke about earlier in the transmission that Gloucester Rowing Club or that near house, I beg your pardon, just having quite a low draw. And that's, you can see from Imogen Grant there, she's really low on the draw, isn't she? She's got everything hooked up down low. Very efficient. Yeah, and um, speaking to Imogen recently, she, she changed her rig for Hendy, especially to deal with this heavyweight racing one-on-one. -on -one. And I think it, at the moment it's paying off for her, because if you were lightweight and you turned around and you were still level with a heavyweight at this point, you probably think you're, you're doing pretty well. But... Alice on the other side probably thinks the opposite thing, that Imogen's got amazing power to weight and it's a long way down the course. So that's why they're probably neck and neck here. Imogen's rating a little higher than Alice, isn't she? Really long strokes from Alice, but she's using her power to good advantage. Got the lead at the barrier, but uh, beautiful expression on the face from Imogen Grant there. Starting to hurt now. Alice Batch just pushing away. And I think this is really interesting, what, you know, what's going through Imogen's mind there because she's down against the heavyweight, but she must feel confident. She feels she's going really well. And, and I think one thing we've learned about Imogen Grant, you know, just recently, last year at the, at the World Championships in Linz, she had that amazing last quarter with her partner in the lightweight double skulls, Emily Craig, to snatch a bronze medal. So we know that she can stay the whole course and she's one tough cookie. Yeah, absolutely. So after this race in 2018, um, Imogen's gone on to be the single in 23 level and is now in the senior lightweight double that's qualified for Tokyo. So we, we now know her caliber and her, her how fast she is, but um, right here, they're both fairly new into the team. So it's kind of a green race for both of them. First time um, Alice has ever raced at Henley Royal. So that's a massive jump into her to jump into the single and do that. But right now, if I was a heavyweight and I was rowing along and there's a lightweight right next to me, I'd be pretty angry. And they, they're the underdog and they have the advantage. And the minute they start clinging on, that's when there's danger. It's really interesting. I mean, do you try and just have a little push to break clear and, you know, that clear water margin so crucial in the single sculling events just means that the sculler behind gets a little bit dispirited, can't see you anymore. The imaging grass just hanging on in there. And, and I'm sure Alice Bartz is just trying everything she can. You see there, the look on her face water quite properly. But this is one, I mean, not normally in, in women's singles race, as well as men's singles races, you know, by now, probably the race might be done and dusted, two, three length margin. It's very rare in single sculling events at Henley that you see one to one with this degree of overlap. Well, I think it just shows you how tough these two girls are. And I think Imogen has raced for Cambridge and is very used to one-on-one -on -one races. So she's had it drilled into her that if you're down, you've not been beaten yet. And you can see that just clinging on. Now, Alice is running quite well. I think her legs are quite nicely timed to the boat. But Imogen next to you, running a little bit higher, and she'd been told before that Imogen's got this killer wind. 
I think I'd be quite frustrated now whilst her having her still in contact there. Oh, so she knew that. That's really interesting, isn't it? If you're sort of sitting there thinking, the sculler next to me has got this really powerful burst at the finish. Yeah, that's what happens when you run the team together. They know each other inside out. So it, she just doesn't quite get that clear water margin, Alice Bats, does she? And Imogen Grant, I mean, you can move a single quickly, can't you? So from being sort of just a length down in, you know, around about 10 strokes, it's possible that you can overturn that verdict and push your bows in the front. And you can see Imogen Grant beginning to sense the crowd, beginning to push on there. Yeah, and interestingly, um, Imogen had a very busy day because she had an exam in Cambridge and they stewards kindly moved this race to the end of the day so she could sit her exam. So she whizzed down from Cambridge, jumped in the single and took on one of the hardest races in the world. And right now she's drawing right back on Alice. She's right close to Bart's on that far side. And that little bit of doubt hopefully is not creeping, in, creeping into her head because she wants to keep her bows ahead. She's kind of gone a bit early, hasn't she? I mean, there's, there's still around 500 metres to go in this race, so there's a lot of sculling for these women, just around about, uh, what, two minutes or so, maybe one minute 50. She's asking her questions, and, and Alice now has to reply with either a change of speed or they're going to draw level. Let's see how she goes through the regatta enclosure. The crowd can't believe their luck seeing a race as close as this between the heavyweight sculler Alice Butts and the lightweight sculler Imogen Grant on the left of your picture in the Cambridge colours. I have to say, Butts has done well keeping that rhythm. She's really been under a lot of pressure, but she's stuck to a rhythm. And uh, she must think, well, this is going to take me through the finish. But in her mind is this question about the killer sprint finish that Imogen Grant has got in her back pocket, just waiting to unleash it. And if you know that and you're sitting only a third of a length up, you probably think go now, but you don't take, take anything for granted because you've just raced 2,000 metres down the rest of the course, so you're pretty exhausted by now. And the red of Agecroft is just keeping ahead here. Yeah, Agecroft, that great club from the northwest. Graham Thomas, another GB squad member from Agecroft. But uh, they're coming practically level now, Jess. Look at that move. And, yeah, here she comes. Bow ball to bow ball. Who is going to, who's going to out sprint who? Just think, Imogen Grant thinks she's got it now. I think we I mean, think she's got it. I mean, if you just go down, you, yeah, you probably do think that. But maybe this is where the weight advantage comes. This is the heavyweight rower is going to hold on to you, and she's got that that power and that strength that someone that's thirty kilos bigger than you has. Just keeping a bow ball just ahead. The rate difference is quite significant between the scholars. Little wobble there from Alice Bats. You can see how difficult the water is, and that's giving Imogen Grant, what, just uh, another 10 centimetres. And I think at that point, Imogen might have a bow ball ahead. Yeah, I definitely think she's ahead at this point in the race. And, and we don't know the result at, at the moment as they pass the hole in the wall, just coming up to the finish line. You'd expect it to be Imogen Grant, wouldn't you, after that move? But just as we come to the finish, it's so close, you can hardly split them. And oh, that was a finish by Alice Batts. And neither of them knew where they came at the end of that race. No way. <laughs> nope. Alice actually said she got stuck under the commentary pontoon and had to have someone shove her out. So um, I think she was pretty exhausted after that. Well, destroyed after that race. And Alice Batts went on to face the world champion from Switzerland, Janine Gamelin, who was the eventual winner of the Princess Royal Challenge Cup in 2018. So we're going back to 2017. It's the first day of the regatta, the Wednesday. Curly Rowan Club closest to us in the blue. You can see the cocks with a hand up there. And on the far side, it's Leeds Rowan Club. Attention. This is a heat of the Thames Go. Challenge Cup. And it is a great race, but, you know, there's lots of reasons for choosing this race because, you know, it's a big, big day for these clubs. They're probably not thinking they're going to get through the qualifiers. Just to get into the first round of Henley, Leeds had to come through the qualifiers. And it's right at the end of the day, half past six, the crowds have gone away. But, you know, the, the supporters of Curly and Leeds have stayed 
around for this race. And, you know, it's their time, their big day. It'll come for other clubs on the Sunday of the finals. But now in the heat of Wednesday, this is where it matters for these two crews. Yeah, to come through the qualifiers and race, this is kind of your big day. Your, 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 your qualification is hard enough. Um, some crews are seeded and have been given a place already by the stewards, but some have to race a week before, and um, the Leeds crew had to do that. This is the Curlew crew there, quite aggressive, and they've just sneaked out about a canvas lead. Yeah, you've got to be pleased with that, Matt Richardson, in the stroke seat of Curlew. You see there the Greek uh, stroke of Leeds, Theodosius Travelos, rode in the under... 23s back in 2008 as a lightweight. I mean, the little lad's only 11 stone six, trying to keep that rhythm up and going. But uh, Curlew, I think, with a weight advantage, that means anything, just powering away in the first part of this race. Yeah, and to slip to a length just before the barrier is quite significant. So they should sit up here, breathe up, and in, in their heads, hopefully come onto a good rhythm and start moving away from leads. But Let's see what happens through the middle of the race. Pretty choppy day, that day out in 2017. It is, isn't it? And, you know, the, the conditions are particularly conducive to spectators. It's the end of the day, it's the first day of the regatta. So, you know, the crowds are pretty thin on the bank, but, you know, make no mistake, this is a big day for these 16 men and two female coxes and their coaches in the launch behind. There we see Lee Drying Club, Theodosius Travelos. Eyes in the boat, no looking round. And uh, they're just listening to their coxswain. Just letting them know what's going on in this middle part of the race. And it looks a little bit agricultural, if you forgive me for saying. It doesn't look like the smoothest or most cohesive of, of rhythms or strokes, but. They're staying in contact here. I think that's it. You get all different styles around. I mean, if we saw the winners of the Thames Cup, you know, from, from 2017, you know, up against either of these two crews, they'd be probably lengths out in front and would be saying, isn't that fantastic? Someone like Thames Rowing Club. But uh, these guys have got a punchy style and maintain contact. So Curly have gone out, the, the crew in blue, to about a length coming through the halfway mark fully and uh, it looks for everything that there's going to be one winner in this race curly strong looking long decent cover they're getting at that high rate leads just sort of hanging on in there but uh, nothing really special to mark the leads crew as you know sprinters at this stage of the race yeah, when you're, when you're about a length behind an eight, it feels like an absolute mile. You can't see anyone. All you can see is the puddles of this crew next to you, and that's quite a lot of noise and puddles. Um, so really hats off to these guys for staying in touch. And here you see them almost just creeping back seat by seat. And this is what's really impressive about this race. Yeah, you just wonder what the race plan was for Leeds Rowing Club, you know, whether they had that digging, you know, go through Forley, and then just coming up to Upper Thames, just... Uh really stick something in. What they won't know, yet, of course, they don't have time to the barrier or Forley, so they'll have no idea about the form of Curly Rowing Club, other than the fact they didn't have to qualify. And I wonder if Leeds just took heart having, you know, come through the qualifiers, I mean, you know, standing around waiting to see if you qualified, and then the buzz when your name gets called out having qualified, you're in Henley Regatta proper, and that motivation is just lifting Leeds through, lifted them through the week before the regatta and into this race. Yeah, they've really hit their peak and their stride. They're doing it pretty well. And to be suddenly a length down to half length down is a pretty amazing feeling. And that curly crew there from over in East London and Greenwich look a little bit ropey now. Now they've been put under pressure. And it must be horrible to have suddenly a crew come straight back up on you. The catcher enclosure, 400 metres left. This is where it gets tasty. It really does get tasty. Curly still have the lead. You've still got to be saying these are the favourites to win this race. I mean, look at that lead. What is it now? It's about just under half a length, maybe half a length to Curly. And there's something like 450 metres left to go, just coming against the public enclosure. Those crowds would be pleased they stayed to see this race. 
6.30 it was on that Wednesday back in 2017, the regatta's first day. Yeah, it really is. It's a really spectacular race. And, and hats off to how hard these guys uh, have rode through the middle of that race to stay in touch. And what is happening now is they've put the Curly Crew under pressure and the Curly Crew aren't responding, which gives you more energy to kind of move to that finish line. Yeah, Curly looked quite good in the early stages of the race, didn't they? But now they're under pressure just a little bit. As they, as they come up with the racing, they've just shortened a little bit. Finish is coming out a little early. And uh, Leeds have got that punchy with them. And now look at what's happening. The crew in black from Leeds on the far side. And it's now a race on. And what have we got about 10, 15 strokes? Curly's still in the lead though, Jess. This is it. Where they're where they going to go? Where Which bow ball is going to go ahead here is right to the line. You don't know who's going to win this race. Curly closest to us. Leeds on the far side. <laughs> What would you say? The camera's not quite on the finish line there, but look at what the Leeds crew did. And uh, and look at Leeds, they just came through. How much, what's that verdict, you reckon, Jess? Four feet, four feet to Leeds, <laughs> which is about a canvas, but that's um, that's as tight as they come. And amazing race, just shows what you can do. If you keep belief, if you keep that cohesion in your crew, it's not over till it's over. It's such a cliche, but it's, it's whoever crosses the line first. So we are back with Phelan Hill for the last race, or in fact, races plural, because we're going to watch a pair of races from 2015 featuring Tyne in the Wyfold. So this is Cox's Fours for Club Men. This is the closing stage of their Wednesday race against Upper Thames. And currently, as you can see, Upper Thames have a clear water advantage. But just as we were discussing earlier with that London race at Henley, Phelan, you should never give up. I mean, at this point now, you'd say, right, that's it. But these time guys keep going. They've obviously practiced hard their, their sprint uh, for the line. But, you know, at this point, when, when you're that far down, but they just keep going, keep going. And that's, and that's what it is. We've talked about it, Matt. You know, when you just get that little bit of a sniff, then then things can change just so quickly. This then is their race from the following day. So what's it like in a, 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 a club crew or a clubhouse, I guess, if you've had an absolute barnstorm of a day and you've got to pick up the next day and do it all over again? I think you have a little bit of a mixed. I think uh, barnstorm on the first day, you obviously get, you feed off a lot of energy initially from overcoming the defeat to go and win it like that. But, you know, it's, it's big after, after that Wednesday and, and you've pushed it all the way to the line, to the mats. You know, the lactate build-up, you know, actual recovery becomes so important. And again, just off the start here, again, it's just like side by side again. There's, there's no break up. There's no sort of like relaxation off the start. And, and probably like a similar profile to their previous day's race you know they're coming through halfway again you know they can't see the other crew again it's um wow so i'm just looking at the nsr oslo race from the program from the day before they had a relatively pedestrian three and a half length win so their situation right those guys they've had a race yeah. that's gone to six inches the day before we've got to halfway with uh, clear water up, it should be no problem from here. No drama, surely. Yeah, no, I mean, you'd be thinking that legs are fresher. They've probably wound in the last bit the previous day. They'll feel good. They come into halfway. They're in a commanding position. Um, and, and, and from a time perspective, you'll be like, right, you know, again, you know, the bowman can't even see the other crew. He can probably just about see the stern of the four. You know, here, you, you would really fancy yourself at this point. Uh, you're in a strong position. And that's what I kind of love about Henley. It's not... I think if this had been a multi-lane race, then I, I'd probably say it's a little bit more game over. But with with Henley, because of the, the nature of it and the knockout stages, you know, it, it's all or nothing. You either, you know, fly or die, as it were. So... 
you've got nothing to lose, just absolutely crap for it. And you can see here now, you know, actually the Oso crew has still got a good lead here and they're coming into the mile marker. So you've only got about 500 or so metres left of the race now. At any moment, you'd be forgiven for thinking, look, I'm brilliant in this regatta. We had one of the best races of all time yesterday. Even if we're overlapping at this point, we've done brilliantly. Let's all go. I've had enough. Thanks very much and goodbye. But absolutely yeah. not a bit of it. No. And again, now look, they've just come into, you've got about, yes, the regatta enclosure, just coming into stewards. You've got about three, 400 meters left. And all of a sudden, again, they obviously like leaving their sprint finishes. They've trained those really well. Um, but all of a sudden again now they're back down to about like half a length here and again they've got that little bit of sniff that they had you know from yesterday and these these time boys now look at them going for it um really impressive really really impressive just to come back and you know i'm i'm pretty sure there will have been some good stories to tell back at the clubhouse uh, at the end of this henley campaign but it it's great to go and see you know other clubs sort of like really mixing it up you know certainly for a crew like time i don't know how often they have the opportunity to race crews from norway and new zealand so one it's great being at henley two you know it's even better racing these international crews but you know finally to turn it around each time by such a small margin you know fantastic mentality I remember recording the highlights uh, that second night on the night and saying that Tyne knew exactly what it needed to get into a highlights reel because I think they were been about the only boat in five years of doing it that have been on two nights in succession. So well done to them again. Reflecting on your career, now that you've moved on into the big grown-up world and no longer rowing, what rowing career left you with? One of the things is just friendship um, and community. I, I would always look back on my time in in rowing and, and say it's the most amazing community ever. Um, and and I think that's, that's really amazing, um, just how close everyone is, how supportive everyone is. And I'm not a massive guy. I'm not talented. Uh, football or anything else and but you know I, I I thought I was just a pretty average person in a way and I I never had a dream that I would ever go to an Olympics r represent my my country and you know all I ever wanted to do was be the best I could possibly be and you know just getting in rowing just took me on this amazing journey. And I think now, um, you know, rowing has probably defined who, who I am now. And I think I look at my work and how I behave in work. I still have that sort of like same mentality that I, like the, you know, used to have from like training where, you know, even where the chips were down and stuff, you, you just wouldn't back away. You would just have to go out and do it. And, I, I remember times when the eight wouldn't be working particularly well and we weren't training very well. I probably wasn't doing a very good job, but people were still supportive, but you still went out and did that 20K with the wind blowing at you from 45 degrees with the torrential rain, with Jürgen cycling beside you. You just made sure that you get it done and little by little, you just kept improving. I probably rode with you know, not just some of the best rowers in the world at that point, but some of the best rowers of all time. That's that's just something awesome to witness and to be part of. Um, yeah, so I just count myself very lucky. Phelan, thank you for your time. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back in Henley uh, in lots of capacities, but uh, look forward to that Thames Cup row pass. That'll hit in, what, 2026, something like that? Yeah. The community of rowing will be a big part of us all uh, going forward. But thanks for your time today. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. It wouldn't be Henley without a lunch break. So we're going to pause now, but we will leave you with some of the sights and sounds of Henley Royal Regatta that we are all missing so much. We'll see you in an hour.
Thank you. 
Thank mm-hmm. you. 
Welcome back to Henley at Home. Still to come is Yaz Farouk, who is the women's coach at University of Washington from the United States. And we're going to wrap up Saturday's coverage with Mahe Drysdale, the Olympic champion in the single skull and winner of multiple diamond skulls at Henley. But we're going to start back with Bobby Thatcher, chief coach of St. Paul's School here in the UK. Bobby, what a very strange summer we are all having, and I suppose extra difficult being in charge of young athletes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to sort of keep the motivation going because um, when we, you know, they're developing their skill base um, technically, but also um, mentally and, and in, in a motivational sense. So when they're locked down on their own, they don't have that sort of group uh, momentum that carries young athletes forward so so that's been been pretty testing to to keep momentum with with young athletes and i suppose for some of them coming to the end of their career this was going to be their sort of crowning summer academically for a few of them sporting wise you know a, a sort of another bitter blow for them to take you know i think i think the first day would have been been very strong and would have would have pushed um the top end uh, through all the major regattas so it's a real shame for the, for those guys um you know i think you you only get that one shot and it never comes back again at that schoolboy level so so it's a shame for those guys but i think all of them intend to stay with the sport and carry on in, in university so and they're, they're continuing to train so there is that positive aspect to it that there there is a, a good university system that they can go into so you know it's not entirely over for them let's rewind the clock two years to, to a happier regatta experience. The sun's shining on the start installation there. We can see the final crew from 2018. Just before we let the film run, talk about the, the preamble perhaps in the season running through. Yeah, well, they, they won the, the, the head of the Charles by uh, 13 seconds, I think, in a new record time. Um, and and then they won the school's head by 20 seconds and then they won that school's by about five lengths five lengths clear water i think um but i think i think the writing was was on the wall they were they're an extremely fast crew and i think um i think one of the reasons for that is the backbone of the boat was the first date the year before so there was there was two years of building the project rather than what you normally have is is one year or you have 50 percent of the crew or a third of the crew and the bulk of the crew was, was the same uh, for two years. So um, I think that was a, a key factor in, in how fast they went through uh, 2018. And I've been back through that regatta experience. Not surprisingly, there was one buy available, which, uh, which you got. Uh, the Thursday yeah. race, you equaled the record to the barrier. The Friday race, you equaled the record to the barrier. The semi-final, the day before this race, obviously, you equaled the record to the barrier. All exactly the same. Um, yeah. very consistent. Uh, what were you sending the crew out? What was the thought that you gave them as you pushed them off the stage uh, for the last time at the boat tents? Well, I think um, we weren't particularly happy with our early rounds. We were going extremely fast, and I think that sort of was a bit detrimental to our early rounds because as we were pushing off for the early rounds, I think we were trying to match the times we'd done in training. And, and as a result, I think... We didn't really hit our rhythm. I think we were quite physical um, and quite chaste and basically racing for a time rather than basically trying to slot into the pattern, which we've been doing all year. So I think the final, we didn't go out to chase a fast time. Um, we just went out and rode our own race and just tried to to relax and put down the pattern that's been... Um, which we've been sort of been developing over the last few years, and you know, if, if you if you watch a race, it looks like we get a lot quicker in the second half, but we we don't really. I think um, the way we're trying to row is that we maintain boat speed all the way down the track. We try and maintain the, the same boat speed by by being relaxed and being effective in what we're doing. So already through the barrier mark, I'm having to mark down that. So 146, that was a new record to the barrier as they came through. Are you the kind of coach that goes in the launch or not go in the launch? No, I don't like it. You know, once in a lifetime opportunity to follow a race, especially a final. Um, so I, I let the parents sit in there. What I tend to do is I cycle to the barrier 
and there's an ice cream van near the barrier, barrier where I stand on the fence. <laughs> And I, I can see the, the flag go down. And then when the flag goes down, I put my watch, I turn my watch on and then, and then I can get time to the barrier. So I know, I know how fast they've gone to the barrier. Um, and then I cycle around the back road and when you're on the top of the hill by behind upper tens, you can see them go through Forley. So I tend so to do that. As this, it, as this final is going, you're busy trying to scoot round, round the back, not seeing yeah. an awful lot, but trying to keep pace with the no. race. Yeah. Um, it's mainly because I like being on my own when they're on the water. Um, so yeah, at this point I could probably see them through the trees as they've gone through Forley. And, and, and now to everyone, it's obvious who's going to win. Um, but it's almost as if nothing changes. They're certainly not taking their foot off the gas. Um, I think what they did well here was they, they, they did a move off the three, four quarter mile and then they just maintained the speed. Um, it was easier to do because there's a nice, light little tailwind. The water was warm. Um, and the Cox, you know, has the splits there. And, and I think we worked out roughly what we needed to do split-wise to, to, to break the record um, for the course. We didn't really focus on it too much. But uh, I remember Axel de Bossard, who was the Cox, was getting excited because he said, like, we were well inside, like, the splits that we needed. So I think the guys knew they were on for a quick time. Uh, judging by the boat speed and how it felt. But I don't, I'm not sure they really knew how, how quick it was going to be. You're blind again. You're, you're hidden behind the trees that we can see on the right, way behind all the stewards, the grandstands and what have you. Can you hear anything back there? No, just the roar. Like, I mean, I, I, you know, coming through here, I, I, you know, I knew they were going to win, but it was just cycling around for the, you know, and then you just caught up in the excitement for an hour off post-race and, you know, People being thrown in, everyone's extremely happy, and, and we have no I no idea what, how the race panned out. It's only really when you go home later and you watch it again on video um, that you can see actually how they rode. And lots of people talk about, you know, the water conditions. I mean, they're well known at Henley. Whether it's fast or slow, it, it's still a challenge to row your best on that stretch, particularly in a final, particularly when you're under pressure, which you know, you obviously, and they were putting themselves under pressure to have a great performance. It's so impressive to see this. It's almost, lots of people are talking about this being a university level crew rather than a schoolboy crew. I mean, we never really spoke about like outcomes of, you know, how fast we were going to go or what we were going to win. We just sort of focused on what we were doing in that moment. And we tried to consistently row as well as well as we could and we always try to sort of put the bar as high as we possibly could like when we race through the season we always entered elite eights you know through the season they were faster than most uh, university crews you know bar brooks so so I think, I think yeah i mean the focus was mainly based on um on you know how well they could develop boat speed and 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 you know maintain it through the year now we're going to turn to a Britannia race. This is Kingston versus Stratford from 2016. As these guys get underway, I want to ask you, what sort of uh, challenge is Henley broadly? Um, you know, you've done pretty much everything there is in the, in the rowing world. What makes Henley difficult and different, whether it's club or university or schoolboy? Um, I think it's a sort of the psychology of the racing, you know, it's dual racing. Um, so you don't really get that in any other form of, of, of racing, especially these days. I think, you know, when I was a junior, I used to do sort of lots of town racing where it'd be one on one, but, but these days everything is, is six lane racing. So um, um, it's how you get to the next, the next race is, is really important. You know, like you, you can have a hard race the day before, which will influence the next day, which you don't necessarily have in, in other regattas. So it's, it's very unique in that sense. And do you stay under the same roof as your athletes during Henley? Because that must change things a little, I suppose. Yeah, we stay, um, we stay with the Parrots in Nettlebed. Um, in the five years we've been there, we've been in three finals and won twice. So if they'll have us, I think we'll, we'll keep going back. <laughs> <laughs> And, and lots of people seem, you know, these club guys would have been at, probably at the draw waiting to see what comes out. Does that make a difference to you 
or what station you draw or who you're likely to get because you know there's no denying it side by side racing can be incredibly tiring and if you have an absolute barnstormer like this early in the competition it's going to clip yeah. your wings and drain your energy for later stages you know i think it's something that bill mason said you've either got to be better than the event or lucky so you know <laughs> i think when it comes to <laughs> I think in 2018 we were we were better than the event, but sometimes I think you need a little bit of luck, like of how you get to the final. You know, I think um, you, you can come up against some really tough opposition early on, and then you might be the fastest crew in the event, but you know it, it might have taken the edge off you by the time you've got to the final, and you might not win. So, but that's Henley, and that's that's the beauty of it. You know, you've, if you really want to guarantee winning Henley, you've got to be really on, on, on the top level to, to do it, you know, because, you know, as Bill Mason said, <laughs> you know, you've got to be uh, better in the event or a little bit lucky. Would you ever consider a club coaching role or a different role? Because a key challenge with school crews is that the change of talent is, broadly speaking, going to be 100% every 24 months on a sort of yeah. rolling nature. Whereas for club boats, like we're seeing here, these guys might be able to put together a three-year campaign, a four-year campaign, and, and build and build and build through it. Whereas you've talked about momentum and building a, a, a squad of athletes, but as a coach, you've got to wave goodbye to at least 50% every year. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'd mean, i never say never. Um, I think I'm open to, you know, doing different areas in the sport but i think what i like about schoolboy rowing is it's it's really rewarding the fact that you, you these guys come to you um you know when they're j14 they haven't they've never been exposed to the sport um and and you have to develop that talent um you can't sort of uh go and take people from other clubs or um you know you've, you've got to develop what's there at the school and i think that's really rewarding that you can create a system that um develop such great athletes and oarsmen. So I really enjoy it, you know, and um, I'm not saying that I'd do that forever, but for the moment I really enjoy it and it's, it's really rewarding. What was your first Henley memory? I think my dad took me there when I was about eight years old. Um, and I literally, I remember not watching any races and walking around the boat tents, didn't really know what was going on. But um, I think that was my first memory of actually being there as probably an eight year old. And then was it uh, an aspiration or a possibility at school? No, I don't think so. I, I raced the first year of the Forley um, ah. in 92. Um, so I, I rode at Quinton um, by Chiswick Ridge when I was a, a junior. Um, and we had some juniors and we, we put together a quad. Um, so that was my first actual experience of racing, Henley. We lost the semi final. Uh, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it took a long time. I think I always aspired to win a Henley medal. Um, and I had a lot of losses before actually getting there. Um, but it, it, it wasn't easy. It's, it's quite a long, hard road to, to actually achieve it. Let's uh, start this uh, P race. This is St. Joe's Prep uh, from the States and uh, Flat Out Oberschule from Germany. Uh, this is a 2019 uh, race from the PE. Are you keeping a wary eye on the opposition as these as the competition de begins to develop? Um, no, not really. You know, you can't really influence what the others are doing, so you can only sort of focus on on how your boat is going. So I, I watch our boat a lot. I watch our racing a lot. I might watch uh, our opposition for the next day, and that's a good thing about the YouTube coverage is you you can do that. I mean, you know, we, we you can be sneaky the, about it. Yeah. And I watched Westminster a lot. Like, you know, we had the final. I think you umpired that race. Um, you know, we, had, we raced Westminster in the final. And, and I, did, I did watch them a, a lot through that regatta. It's hard to follow races at Henley, especially when, you know, the races are prime time. There's no, there's no way you're going to be able to... You might get a snapshot somewhere on the course, but you can sort of sit and go back through the footage and really analyse what they're doing. So, so, yeah, no, it's really useful. And as a coach, how would you feel about uh, data coming back from the crews and being displayed on screen, whether that's boat speed or rates of striking? Because crews are a bit nervous about GoPros or they might be a bit nervous about data coming back from the crews. How are you as a coach about that? 
I'm fine to be honest. Like you know, I think we, we, we always get approached about putting a GoPro on our boat for Henley, and uh, you know, I just think I've got nothing to hide. You know, your speed, your speed. If you think back to the way you were as a junior, how would you, as a coach now, coach a 17, 18 year old Bobby Thatcher? Um, oh, when I think back to myself as a junior, I, I, I really don't think I had an idea how to row. <laughs> like. Uh, <laughs> I, I think for me it was just it was just hard work you know it was, it was effort and hard work um I think you know I would do the same as I do with the boys is just you know make it a lot more sort of simple and 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 try and guide myself in training smarter rather than harder um and be a lot more focused on how I'm doing it rather than doing it for the sake of doing it so I think I'd, I'd, I'd try and guide myself in being a lot smarter in uh, in how I row and how I train. Because I think everything I did as a kid was just as hard as I possibly could with no real sort of thought to how I was doing it. Now, you've been coached by some of the really great coaching names who've been through British rowing over the years during your international career. I'm thinking of Martin McElroy, Jürgen Grobler, of course. How much have you learned from them and taken from them? Or have you crafted your own skill set largely from your own input rather than taking stuff from them? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's some sort of positives. I think you can learn from some negatives as well. There's, there's areas of coaches that you, you didn't think was so great. Um, I think for me, I think Harry Mann was technically the guy that really influenced the way I like to, to the boys to row. I think it's basically effort for... Well, sorry, speed for for everything you're putting into it. You don't have, you know, it's um, it's easy speed basically. So um, he he was a, a key influencer on on what I try and achieve technically. Um, I think it's also like a humane approach that um, you know that you don't treat the boys like a, a commodity. You know, they're sort of and they're there to develop and learn. And and rowing is actually just a, a sidetrack to their education and their life and it should be sort of viewed as that it's not the most important thing you know I think we really focus on you know them developing as people and their studies and um, so it's more of a sort of a rounded rounded package rather than just being overly focused on being sportsmen so I think there's sort of little bits you take from everyone over the years but I think there's you know one, one guy that also really influenced me was Sid Rand he used to coach um yeah like a lovely man and I, I thought his approach was very humble and very humane and and I think that's one influence I like to have when when I'm coaching you know did you enjoy the squad atmosphere that we had I mean I was part of it too in the run-up in the sort of mid to late 90s was that was that an environment that you look back on and remember with fondness or is it no that wasn't right um, yeah, I think I think our time was fun. I, I did enjoy it. Um, I think you know we were there when lottery funding was just starting to come in, um, and I do look at, back at it with like you know we had some really good times and a lot of fun. I think maybe post the time we were in the squad, I think maybe it's got a little bit more sort of um, more uh, more professional, I guess. And maybe with that, mm -hmm. the, there isn't the sort of fun element element that was there when we we were right. Um, but yeah, I, I look I look back on it, and it was a learning experience. And I, you know, I did I did enjoy the time time rowing on the national team. Great stuff. Bobby and I are going to have a break. We're going to get to watch another record breaking crew. This is in the Forley. The Windsor Boys School in the Bucks Station. They're up against Maidenhead Rowing Club A in the Bucks Station. There's just a little bit of steering there from the Maidenhead crews. They've gone off the block, need to get themselves back on their station. A great start here by the Windsor Boys School. Eduardo Marshall from Maidenhead Rowing Club A, he looked across. He's letting them know that they're just slightly down on Windsor Boys here at the moment. A so quality crew here from the Windsor Boys School. Absolutely the hot favourites to take out this event and they seem to be rowing true to form, really taking this race by the scruff of the neck. But we're going to see a warning there from the umpire. 
to the Maidenhead Rowing Club A crew. They really don't need that at this stage. They are too far into the centre of the course and already down that little adjustment will really hit them pretty hard here at this stage. The technical side of what they're doing there is really good. Really impressive in unison, moving together. This is a great row here from the boys. They've got about a length clear of the crew from Maidenhead. So that's another record time gone today to Foley. 3.08 for Windsor boys. That's three seconds off the previous record. So they're definitely not holding anything back in this final. So we've had 10 course records set here today. It looks like we might see another one go here. You know, what better way for these crews to kind of end their season by going the fastest time they've ever seen on the Henley course in these particular events. And just see the way that the Windsor crew are chaining there. It just it looks like poetry watches. Beautiful. Just coming into the stewards and clothes, just staying loose, relaxed, not getting flustered, just being in control. Such an impressive race so far. The way they've gone off the blocks, led from start to finish, taking control of the race, grabbing it by the scruff of the neck. This is just so impressive. As they come down to the line, the Windsor Boys School, they came here to retain the Fawley Challenge Cup after winning last year, and they have done it. We're going to have a short break now in the company of Jess and Martin with two more hidden gems. And this heat of the silver goblets from 2018 on the Friday is an absolute corker. We've got uh, Josh Bogowski and James Rankin on the left of your picture, Newcastle and Oxford. And on the right of your picture, the crew from Leander Club, Harry Glenister and George Roster in the stroke seat. And this is a hell of a barnstormer. It really is between two pairs, both from the national squad, both vying for places in the GB national teams. And uh, I love watching Silver Goblets races when they're close. I think, Jess, that's because I never won the Silver Goblets myself having rowed at Henley. I lost by... He's got a chip on his shoulder. I have, I lost by a foot in the final. And um, yeah, yeah, someone's got my medal. <laughs> yeah, and we picked this race because it's, um, we see a lot of clubs racing at Henley. It's the peak of their season. And some people think these international crews come for a jolly or a fun race, but it's really important for them. And these two guys, these two crews, sorry, are on the edge of the squad. They're, they've been in and out of it. And now they're actually solidly in the team. But this is them with their coach, Jürgen Grobler, in the launch behind them, watching them. This means a lot to these guys, and it's really important for them in their career. Yeah, and what you see there is uh, Josh Bugowski in the stroke seat of that boat. The camera's closing in on them, and you see the back of James Rodkin in the bow seat. And, and James has gone on to win a couple of bronzes in the British Eight in 2018 and 2019. Josh Bugowski was in that eight who got bronze in 2019. I mean, they're real strong oarsmen. James. Uh, James Rudkin is a great boat mover. Josh Bogowski is so strong on the ergometer. You know, he's sort of uh, low 540s, I think, for his 2K test. And you can see that power, can't you, Jess? Really taking that pair out as they come through. And, and that's a winning lead, really, at this margin, uh, you know, at this sort of event, you know, with those athletes of that experience, that is a winning margin. Uh, a length of clear water, you've got two of the biggest ergo pullers in the squad. You'd be pretty happy if you're in that boat right now. Um, Josh has got an incredible story, which we won't go into now, but he's a guy from Stockport, took up rowing at Cardiff Uni, someone tapped him on the shoulder and said, you could be really good at this. One of those incredible stories, and here he is now in the national team. But um, back to this race, a length of clear water coming through Remenham, I'd be pretty pleased with that. But just going back to this Leander pair, they just look a little bit smoother. Yeah, I like them off the back turn. There's a, a look by Harry Glenister, and, you know, I wonder if he senses just where Rutkin and Bugowski are. They're, they're definitely, the Leander definitely came into this race as underdogs, and Bugowski and Rutkin, they're starting to look a little bit heavy now. You see, the way that uh, Josh Bugowski's catch going in, the stroke man in the, uh, I think, the Oxford Brooks, uh, 
One piece. It's a real smack on the front end, isn't it? Very, very dramatic. There's not much sort of slipping the blade in, and you can see that uh, Leander are now coming right back in the picture, Jess. Yeah, so he's got Keeble, he's got his university college Lycra on. Um, yeah, that's what it is. And they, you can see the shot here, it's quite aggressive, but almost the boat wobbles quite a lot. And when you go back to Glenster and Rossiter, their boat is much straighter moving and, and not as much side wobble. So you've got the big, big, strong guys against the, the, the silkier boat movers here. And this is where you see they're slowly closing the gap. And that's a lovely feeling when you slowly close a gap. And you're doing it all on, on, on rhythm, just that uh, cohesion that uh, Glenister and Roster have got off the back end. I think, I think that might be Matt Beachy in the launch, actually. Is that the Leander coach in the launch there, just behind? Yeah, that's Matt Beachy with Jürgen a couple of places behind him. Um, just warning Budowski and Rudkin here, who look a bit ropey. They're getting under pressure, and suddenly these Leander guys, Bernister and Rossiter, have slipped up to a length, and they've got 100 metres to make a difference now. 100 metres to go. It's just so exciting, but, you know, the uh, pair at the top, Newcastle and Oxford, really look to be in the driving seat, but they, don't, they look a bit agricultural now, don't they? Just smacking it in. What a great serve by the board from Leander on the left of your picture. Oh my goodness, are they going to come right through? And Bukowski and Rudkin coming over, play clash as they cross the finish line there. And uh, well, he knows, doesn't he, George Roster with the red cap? He knows he's got that chest. What a race. And I mean, it didn't do these boys any harm with their chief coach, Jurgen Grobler, watching from the launch behind. Now both these boys are the national team. There's the finish. That's close, isn't it, Jess? Oh, that's as close as it gets, especially as both crews are clashing almost coming up that line, so they probably didn't know. Oh, no, hold on. He knew. <laughs> yeah, Harry Glenister got his arms in the air, and that's a sweet, sweet victory, isn't it? You see what it means to them. They definitely weren't the favourites for this race, but uh, they had that nice, punchy rhythm all the way through, and they kept loose as they came towards the end. Yeah, great race. You're now joining us for the start of the Town Challenge Cup of Women's Fours, University of London Boat Club in the yellow boat on the top of your screen versus Princeton Trading Centre in the white Hudson boat on the right of your screen. Yeah, and this is a great little race, Princeton Trading Centre. You normally see that name on the entry sheet and you think, well, they're probably going to win because of the might of the US national team. They train at Princeton there in New Jersey under their chief coach, Tom Tahar, and you expect those crews to be really strong, but this is a bit of an under-23 race, Jets, and uh, certainly that's the case with the club representation from University of London on the left new picture in the yellow boat as we see them go away, leading Princeton Trading Centre this early in the race. Yeah, so what you've got here is one of the top under-23 um, level crews from, from GB, the University of London, They'd won a gold in the Champ 8 earlier on in the year at Books Regatta versus what is the under-23 USA women's four? So I think the USA 23 four probably thought they'd walk away with this, but suddenly being let down to UL, end of the barrier, looks like it's going to be a tasty race. It certainly does. And uh, these women's fours event have come into Henley because since we had gender equality in the Olympics, lightweight men's fours went out after 2016 and uh, for the Tokyo Games in 2021, the women's fours, well, that will be the first time we see that event. And it's really made its own in the World Championship format. And this is Henley's offering the Town Challenge Cup. Princeton coming back into the race and now we've got game on because UL had that great lead. But the women from Princeton stroked by Martin in the stroke seat really coming back into the race. But you are really sweet off the back end, Jess. Yeah, the UL crew look a little bit more slinky, a bit more cohesive. These girls have worked together a lot. Um, only addition is Emily Lindbergh, who got added to the crew quite late. And here you go, Princeton, a bit more rough and ready, probably a little bit stronger, probably outpowering the GB girls. have just slipped to a canvas coming up to the Remenham. And at this point, you've got to be pretty confident if you're in that Princeton crew. You know you're in the national team, one of the best national teams in the world, the American women's program, and you've got half a length off this university crew next to you. 
I know, and, and it does give you that confidence when you move through another crew and you, you know, start to edge away, just put your bows in front a little bit. As the second half of the race progresses, that, you know, that, that is your race, really. And uh, you're going to think, well, University of London will perhaps not be able to come back from there. John Hedge of the umpire warning the Americans just to move over a little bit. And that's the stroke woman steering that boat. But uh, you are not to be put off that high cadence around the back. Here we see Princeton National Training Center. They've got USA on their chests. They're the national team and they're sitting a canvas up on this university crew. But it's starting to look a bit more ropey now. And I think this is where the University of Crew start to get a sniff. And, and this crew start sticking with them and not letting the Princeton crew move. And it'll cut away in a second and we'll see that. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Jess. And the purple from University of London as they went past up at Thames there. It's still down on the might of the Princeton Training Centre, but it's only by something like a canvas. And I think now the dads come into the Princeton Training Centre, you know, they haven't gone away and the UL haven't given up. And now they know they're in a barn fight for the last 450 metres or so. You see Ali French steering the boat that's a blonde pigtail up there in the bows of the university of london boat i think it's one of the worst things you can do the most devastating thing you can do is absorb another crew's push and princeton have pushed back on them and the ul crew just absorbed it and at this point now princeton are going to be absolutely kicking themselves they're in a world of pain they've just pushed on and ul have taken everything they've thrown at them yeah, that's the stroke woman just steering, and she probably hasn't got a good sight down, and John Hedger has, has just told her to move over. So she's put the rudder on one way, Jess, and now she's put the rudder on the other way to straighten up, and that's maybe lost them just a few centimetres. Yeah, it feels very small and closed and tight inside those booms at Henley, and there you go, UL. If take advantage of that and moved out by a length, you would not have said that 100 metres ago. No, absolutely. It's a great move by University of London. Princeton just lost it. The steering, I think, was symptomatic. But they looked tight in the shoulders, just not as long as they were in the race. And uh, UL just coming up to the finish, Jess. Yeah, it's outstanding. And, and I think one thing to look at is these girls from the UL crew went on to represent GB, and they're all in 23 medalists and representation and it's it's really a massive stepping stone for these girls and it's really important that we have this women's fours event and more women's events introduced because there is an appetite for it and right here look at that racing it's incredible so one last race in the company of bobby thatcher who's obviously the coach of st paul's we've talked about the pe let's turn our attention again we saw in the record breakers a little bit earlier on but this is another uh, great race in the forley um, you mentioned that you were right in the first edition of the Forley. What has this event done for junior boys sculling in the UK and arguably sculling higher up in the echelons? This has really raised the standard of sculling. I think, you know, when I was a junior, sculling was seen as a bit of a joke. But, um, you know, now we've got junior world championship quads, uh, goal winning quads, and, uh, and the guys are winning medals on a regular basis. So I think. You know, it's been it's been fantastic for that, but it's also been great for the smaller schools like Windsor, who don't have the the numbers and budgets to really compete with the with the eight. So you know, this has given them like a real lifeblood to sort of push rowing forward in in the smaller schools. That's definitely a conversation happening around the PE that it's out of the four junior events, well, it will be four junior events when the uh, junior girls eights gets going. The PE is the last one standing that's deliberately and specifically and only for schools. Where yeah. are you on that debate? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm supporting the stays with schools. I think if you open it up to, to clubs, um, you've, you've, you're probably going to sort of have the Americans coming over who, you know, the American school system, um, you know, when you look at the, the national championships, it's dominated by the, um, the associations um, because the schools can't compete, you know, they just, the associations can have a pull of, you know, 30, 40 schools. Um, 
in terms of selecting athletes. And as a school, you have to develop your own talent. So you just can't compete with it. Um, and I think if we lost, if the PE basically went to, um, opened up the clubs, I think it would really sort of have a knock-on effect on the, the level of schoolboy rowing in this country. I think, you know, especially as, as young athletes are trying to get recruited from a lot of the Ivy League universities, they, you know, we possibly might start losing our top guys to go and row with a club that might win Henley. So um, I think you'll probably see a lot more club hopping and I think the standard of, um, of the school's rowing would, would go down. So I'm, I'm in the camp of that. I think it should be kept a, a schoolboy event. What is harder to qualify, the PE or the uh, Forley that we're watching now? Yeah, I'd say I'd say that the standard of the Forley, um, because I think it's um, um, isn't it a smaller event than the P? Is it third? Is it? Uh, um, not, yeah, it's twenty four, I think, at the moment. Yeah, so it's a slightly smaller event. Um, you know, we tend to we tend to put our second eight into the P, but I think you know the standard is is really high across across the board, really. Um, from in the Forley, I'd say probably the earlier rounds of the Forley are probably a, bit, a little bit tougher than the P. Uh, you did uh, both sculling and sweeping in your career. Which did you enjoy more? I don't know. I mean, uh, my favourite was the pair, to be honest. I really like wearing a pair. Man after my own heart. Yeah, there's something about it. Like, if you can get a pair going well, it just feels so nice. I don't know. I don't know if I was really, you know, I sculled, but I, don't, I, don't, I had more success rowing. So I don't know if it was because I was better suited rowing, I don't know. I mean, but maybe I was more talented at rowing or more sculling, but I do like going for a single skull. I think that's pretty special. But I'd, I'd probably say I'd prefer sweeping than, than sculling. Obviously, a lot of your junior athletes go to the States for their university rowing and their education. Uh, and obviously, from an institution like St. Paul's, it's Ivy League and, and you know, they're shooting the lights out academically and sporting-wise at the same time. Are you at all concerned about that being a growing trend or should we just encourage them to do where to go wherever they need to go? When I was over at the head of the Charles um, last year, we had uh, 16 St. Paul's boys racing there for Ivy League universities um, who've graduated in, from St. Paul's in the last three years. Um, and if I look at the guys who have gone to America, they're staying with the sport. And if I look who's staying here, most of them give up. So I think going to America, they because the, the structure's there to develop them as athletes, you know, I don't think we've had a guy who's gone to, who's gone to the US who's quit. They've, they've all gone through the full four years. And I think, yes, they might have gone for four years, but they're, they're coming back to this country after rowing for four years where most of our guys who stay here, you know, if, if, they, if they're rowing for university in the UK, a lot of them will quit because they think, well, we're losing to high school crews. So, like, <laughs> so um, um, they, they don't, doesn't quite have the same system here for university rowing as it does in the US. And I think it's just really appealing for the guys. So I personally encourage it. I think as, as long as, you know, they're staying in the sport, I think it's positive. What about next stages for St. Paul's after this? sort of summer that never was, um, you know, it seems difficult to plan even a month ahead, never mind two, three months ahead. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, the, the, the senior boys have been really good. Like, they've, they've kept the wheels turning. Um, and I think that's all we can really do is keep consistent training. Like, I took five of them out sculling today, five guys from the first day who are all back next year. First time since I've been down to the boathouse since uh, the end of March, um, and they're all really positive. Um, they're all, they've all kept training, so I think I think all we're doing is is you know what can we do that day to make ourselves better? We're not thinking too far ahead. It's just you know what training can we do today, and just keep the wheels turning and keep it consistent because we we don't know what the winter's going to look like. We don't know what autumn training is going to be like. I mean, we, we hope that the season next year will, will be okay, but. I think as we as long as we get to the other side of Christmas in good shape, and, and a lot of that comes from like self responsibility for the guys, um, you know. And I think that's all we can do really is just manage what we're doing on from a day to day basis. So as we watch Leander and Windsor boys come in another barnstorm, how well do you know the Windsor boys set up, Bobby? Um, well, Mark Wilkinson is the coach there. Um, 
he's an ex uh, GB lightweight um, and he's doing an absolutely fantastic job I think you know a school like Windsor they, they don't have the resources um, as, as some of the other clubs or schools they have to develop their own talent um, in a state school environment um, and I think he does an absolutely fantastic job and you know um, watching back on this race I think they were sort of giving away 10 kilos a man uh, to Leander boat and I think you know phenomenal crew and, and phenomenal coach and I think it's amazing what he's doing um, at Windsor. Bobby, listen, thank you. Um, thanks for your time. I know it's, uh, yeah, I've used the word several times in this. It's just a sort of strange summer for us all. This is sort of strange talking to you in a computer. Um, yeah. Look forward to having a, having a beer with you and sharing a gossip on a towpath at some point, hopefully very soon. Cheers, Matt. We're going to take another short break now. We'll be back in a few minutes with Yaz Farouk from UW.
We're joined for this section by Yaz Farouk, uh, women's coach at University of Washington. Yaz, how are you in this strangest of summers? We've had plenty of team Zoom calls, you know, once a week uh, through finals. We just got done with final exams. And uh, here we are in the summer and still at home, but technically starting the re-entries. You must have been right at the forefront because I seem to remember the college program was very early to go. It feels like a lifetime ago now when we were all going into this, but having to tell athletes, that's it, it's done, we're not racing, go home pretty much, must have been so difficult. It was sudden. You know, we had raced in Las Vegas. We actually got one race in in the season, and I remember being in the airport and saying, um, uh, don't touch your face, wash your hands a lot because we knew the virus was among us, but things hadn't been shut down yet. And then literally a week later, we had morning practice per usual. And three hours later, everything was shut down and, and we were told to send everybody home. So for our international athletes, they literally got on a plane um, that night, packed up their rooms, packed up everything and left. And that was it. And for some of those, are they are they seniors? You might not see them again in a rowing coaching capacity? Six were seniors, and uh, the NCAA actually passed a rule where they allowed them to come back. And so four of the six are going to return next year. So that's the one silver lining. So let's go back uh, to this 2018 crew that you bought uh, to Henley, to the Remenham. Uh, what's that experience like for this crew? You had you had a, a Princeton race uh, the day before, and then this is the, the the Saturday, a sort of marquee race of a Saturday afternoon. Uh, what was the running like for you guys? Well, first we were so excited to just have the invitation, and we had pulled three of the women who are in this boat on the right of the screen. Uh, we're in the under 23 camp the week before. So this essentially allowed us to reunite our team. Then they had to race against their own USA teammates. Um, prior to this race against Great Britain, we fortunately won it and then had this awesome opportunity to race against this uh, group of national team hopefuls from GB. And I think both you and I were involved. I I'm umpiring. I think you were in the launch this day. Were you in the launch? Yeah, I was. Yep. What a view, um, too, by the way. It's the best <laughs> view for a coach. What's the experience like? Because as has been made abundantly clear over the, over the years, uh, you can't say or do anything. Oh, I know. You, you definitely would get a stern look even from the umpire if you you know, looked at your team too hard, I think. But, you know, for me as a coxswain, I love this view, you know, so it's it's perfect. You're behind the crew. This is the way that I've, you know, spent decades watching the blades. And so it's awesome. And also because of the current and the steering, you know, being such a factor in this race, um, I just to have that opportunity to be right behind the crews there. It's like you're in the boat. And it's something that that is leveled as an accusation to most coaches that they don't coach the coxswains enough or even at all on occasion. Uh, that can't be true with you. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is in the race prior to this one against Princeton, um, our coxswain Phoebe Marks Nichols knew that the bark station was going to have a little advantage off the start. So as soon as she got off the line, she started to ease a little bit towards the center, which, you know, we had definitely talked about. It happened. But Boris was our umpire, and that was a big no-no. And he got the flag out and uh, uh, was quite stern with her. And then today, in this semi against uh, GB, uh, she didn't make the same mistake. But it's, it's particularly difficult uh, at Henley because you can see them there. The, the posts and the booms are an imposing barrier. Unlike boys that you can make a mistake with a boy, you can sort of rattle over the top of them on occasion and it doesn't matter. There is no margin for error. It is scary how close they feel when you're steering on your station, which your crew is doing so nicely here. It feels like they encroach. 
Yeah, I know. It's like you don't want to get too close to that boom because it's 100% unforgiving. <laughs> However, you'll see as we get uh, deeper in this race and the fatigue sets in, uh, they do get a little close to the boom. And I talked to her about it afterwards, and, and she was definitely trying to steer off, you know, steer away from it, but also not slow the boat down because, you know, that's what happens when you have to get on the rudder. You want to have a gentle hand at Henley for sure. And what sort of experience for these athletes is it coming over? I mean, we, I suppose, being British and me rowing at school and as a junior, it, we sort of get used to this. Um, what's it like for them coming to witness it and experience it for the first time? I've made a, a promise that at Washington, we will come to Henley every four years. That's the most that you're allowed to in women's rowing. You can only do a foreign tour every four years. And uh, every athlete that I've ever coached who's come to Henley has said that it was the experience of a lifetime. And their parents have said exactly the same thing. So uh, we, um, we want to be here every four years. And I know our parents want to be able to come too. So it certainly is something that every athlete aspires to make a boat that um, will come to Henley. And in this case, we came with an eight, a quad and a double. And next time I'd like to bring as many boats as I can. And how do you prepare those individual athletes for a race? What, what sort of uh, routine do you get into in a race day? You know, it's similar routine to what you and I, you know, enjoyed, I think, uh, as Olympians, you know, the same deal, although the magic of being at Henley and being in that tent, you know, the, the, t the boat tent where everybody else is, that really is unique to that venue and it's special. I remember being there in 2015 with Stanford and we did the time trial and that's where we were standing when they announced that we had actually qualified for the race. And, and I'll never forget that moment as long as I live being in that tent. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but the, the sense of achievement for so many people, whether it's schools, clubs, even you know experienced university athletes of making it through to the side by side is, is something to behold. It felt like winning the lottery. <laughs> What did you say to these guys after that race? Oh my gosh, I was just so proud that uh, um, we were able to, to, to fight, to be in it, to actually lead it for a while. I remember the coach on the other side of the motorboat, I think that he just thought they were going to handle us and put us away by many lengths of open water. And the commentators were pretty surprised too. So the fact that we were in it for so long, um, and then, you know, I have to believe that having the home crowd for the GB team was certainly a lift in the enclosure and uh, um, something, you know, we talked about and we talked about pretending that they would be there for us, but they were there for their own team. <laughs> so. This is uh, the women's double skull, as was then. It's since been uh, properly named the Stoner. Uh, Donahue and Lowe, New Zealand. Uh, Oldenburg and De Jong, uh, the Netherlands. And you've talked about this interaction between some of the very best in the sport and everybody else, you know, at the, the boat tents, at the venue. That's very different. And, and, and speaking personally, I got, an, I got a kick out of both sides of that equation, both as a junior and then as an international later on. There's something very different because it doesn't exist i don't think anywhere else in the rowing world that you're all at the same event and then leaving from the same place right and i think for the kiwis this year i think this was the first time they had come to henley is that right as a national team yeah I think and very so close, yeah. Uh, it is just such a change in venue too from the international scene um where you really do get to um honor and um enjoy our sport in its most traditional sense. And how do you reflect now on your time in the national team? How much of that experience tips out into your coaching? Oh, a ton. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, uh, I feel really lucky to have had uh, great coaching. Hartmut Buschbacher was my coach during the time and uh, uh, his head coach when he was in Germany was your coach, Jürgen Grovler. 
And uh, so I learned a lot about training from him. And then Tom Terhar was our assistant coach. And, um, you know, obviously among the best, you know, three-time Olympic gold medal coach for the U.S. Women's Eight. And uh, he certainly helped me, uh, guide me in my coaching career. You probably trained and raced and, and interacted with the, the very forefront of women's international rowing, who in the early 80s, they weren't racing the same distance as the men. Then there was a parity in distance and challenge. Now the boat classes have been have been matched up. And so that you the experience that these women that were watching race here have as part of an international team is very different to what you had, which in itself is very different to what was even 10 or 15 years before you. The, the change in three decades is really significant. I'm so happy that these women are truly equals in our sport now. And when Henley added the uh, the additional women's events these last couple of years to me, and, and especially for the, the schedule was so packed. And I remember talking to you about uh, how to make that adjustment. And you did, you know, and I think for that to happen at Henley was was huge. And it was the right message for our sport. It literally took until just a couple of years ago uh, in the Olympic uh, schedule for us to have an equal number of women as men. And my first Olympics back in 92, I don't know if you'll remember this, but the women's events were in the morning. So we raced the women's eight in the morning and the premier events at the end of the last day were, I think it was the men's coxed pair, the men's coxed four, the men's straight four and the men's eight. That, that was considered the, the ramp up and the women were definitely not a part of that. So um, it's a completely different world for these women racing today, and I'm really glad that we've gotten there. And how do you uh, develop a, a sort of um, atmosphere within your squad? A, a, you know, esprit de corps is what the French would call it. I'm trying to think of the right motivation. You know, how do you generate uh, a, a history and a and a a team where they've only come, they might only come together a year before, two years before. Well, you know, at Washington, it's, it's really, there is a huge tradition there for the men and the women. And uh, in that boathouse, everybody is equal. The funding is equal. We are treated exactly the same. So uh, on a daily basis to have that kind of interaction with your partners in the boathouse, is really pretty special. We really honor the hardship that the women went through, particularly in the 70s. That was a period where women were not welcome in the boathouse and uh, a little better in the 80s. And now um, at the NCAAs, I think outside of the Olympics for eights racing, it's the most exciting finishes that you'll have in the sport of rowing. Typically in the semifinal, you'll have a crew go out by a couple hundredths of a second. It happens almost every year. And just watching these Kiwi scholars, they're sort of the, the foremost proponents of their craft in the world. It's just, you know, as an as a impartial observer, it's just great to see, it's great to watch. They're, uh, the fitness of this crew um, you know, especially over 2,000 meters or what is it, 2,117 or something at Henley? Uh, to have 2 that 1 kind 2, of, 2112. 2112. I was off by five. Um, <laughs> you know, that's uh, when the race is even just that, uh, you know, 112 meters longer, that can make a difference. Obviously, not in this race. I mean, these two were just truly coming into their own this uh, summer, they would go on to win the world championships in 2017 and again in 2019. And now they're the favorites heading into the Olympics. And let's just talk a little bit about your coaching transition from athlete then to, uh, there was a period where you didn't coach after your international career. It wasn't a straightforward change from athlete to coach, but now the coaching is the only thing you're doing, it's, it's a, a career as good as anybody else. I, I guess I couldn't stay away. You know, I really thought I was <laughs> retiring <laughs> after 96 and I worked in the private sector for a decade. 
But um, three months after I moved to the West Coast, I was driving to the mountains with my husband and we uh, happened to drive by this little lake and there was a regatta there. And we pulled over to check it out and someone recognized me and I was back in the boat. <laughs> so I made it for three months, you know, out of the sport. And then, uh, then I just did it, you know, on the side for fun and did a little commentary. And uh, then Stanford called me up and asked me uh, to come and uh, if I wanted to be a coach. And initially I said no, but they convinced me. And then uh, I did that. I was there for 10 years and now I'm at Washington. So this is uh, the Brit, so men's club uh, fours, Cox fours, St. Andrews and Harbourfield. Um, obviously, the straightforward technical difference for a Cox four is that you're uh, bow loaded. You're, you're, it's almost impossible to see the coxing there. Did you ever enjoy being in a front loader? You know, the, um, the view is better. You know, you can see where you're going, but you can't see the blades, you know, so you don't have the luxury of, of um, seeing the details for coaching. But I will say in the bow loader, you develop boat feel in a completely different way. And I learned a ton from the opportunities I had from being in the bow. And I think it really did enhance my skills overall. Do you train your university athletes at Washington in a, a variety of boats? How small does it go? It's always a sort of uh, classic criticism I seem to remember from the 90s that Americans never understood pairs. No, you know, no, very little sculling going on. It was all sweep. It was all big boat. Is that true? Uh, not for us. Uh, we spend a ton of time in pairs <laughs> and every single person learns how to skull if they don't know already. Now we have a lot of juniors who will come in and they've learned how to skull before they've learned how to sweep. And I disagree with the people who say that it's easier for scullers to go to sweep than sweepers to go to sculling. I think it depends on the person. But I definitely, as a coach at Washington, have coached some pretty elite scholars and had to teach them how to sweep. And how much effort do you put in to recruiting and picking your squad and planning ahead? Because it must be an enormous pressure and an enormous effort to do that. Well, and you want to choose wisely because um, especially with international rowers you're recruiting, there is a scholarship that you are going to give to them. And there's only there's a set number of scholarships. So the maximum that can be allowed uh, in women's rowing is 20. So you want to make sure that when you you're not handing out those scholarships, you are very carefully selecting the caliber of person that you're going to award one to. And this Harbourfield crew have come around the world from Australia to race. How difficult is the time change? I mean, they've got to turn it completely upside down. But even from the the West Coast, you're talking eight hours. Are we different at the moment? Yes. And uh, also for some teams, for us at Stanford and now at Washington, we also have to come right after final exams. So <laughs> we finish the season, go into final exams. You're not allowed to coach them during finals at all. And then after the finals are over, um, you get on a plane and, and head to the UK. And uh, yeah, it's, it's hard, but you know, I think that everyone is just so excited about, you know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to come to Henley, especially because we only can come every four years. So in your time at Washington, you've got one shot to go to Henley. But uh, this race, I just love this one because uh, the St. Andrews crew, I mean, you might look at them and say technically, it's, you know, maybe a little rough around the edges, but they launch this race like they know it's going to be uh, all about perseverance. And then they just keep fighting every single stroke. I mean, at any point when here you see UTS starting to come back into them, and I don't think UTS ever gets their bow ball ahead. I think it's, well, maybe right here it's level, but the St. Andrews crew has a response for everything they throw at them. Just what guts. <laughs> Look at that guy's face. <laughs> There's something particular about the Henley challenge, which is one on one, which is sort of a dying art in, in UK rowing. There are very few one on one races left. I think there are more in the US, but 
it, it's so different to six across. Oh my gosh. And I think especially here with, you know, the nuances of the current and the, you know, when you get a little breeze, um, what I told my coxswain when we came into this race is um, no lead is ever safe. And on the other hand, you're never out of the race. And I think that is the other aspect of Henley that just makes it so appealing. And when you're uh, coaching, do you have a dialogue in your head when you're watching your crew race? Is that a coxing voice? Is it a coaching voice? Is it a race announcer's voice? Because you've done all three. I, I, I always feel, I'm honestly pretty calm in there, but I think I go into coxswain mode where I'm looking at both crews and I'm assessing what the speeds are. And as a coxswain, I would always look at the blades and when you get really advanced, you just look and you see and you think, where can I get more speed? So I'm always looking at the blades thinking, where can I get more speed? And in this race, with these two coxswains right now, you know, they're in front of the enclosure. It's the final strokes. And uh, there's a shot in here where they show both of their faces and they both look like their heads are just going to blow right off of their bodies. They're, they're throwing everything they've got into it. I think this is one of the races uh, that uh, Steve, the chairman, watched and said, we've got to get that sorted out because that was a really close race and we can't see how much they won by. We need to get the finish camera because the footage is taken off for the finish judges to have a look at. And now, nowadays we can get it in the, uh, in the coverage, but we couldn't back then and it, it, you miss it. You don't, you don't see it properly. We're going to have a little break. Uh, Yaz and I are going to have a drink and a gossip offline. It's time for a record breaker race. This is the Diamond Jubilee and another crew that came across the Atlantic and did absolutely brilliantly. Why Quad Cities this is. So the Diamond Jubilee Challenge Cup and it's USA against a local boat. Marlow Rowing Club from just up the road. And this is such a hotly contested event. The standard of this event since we introduced it has gone for the roof. There's so much on this start. You can set the pace and Marla just drifting out and we could have a meeting of the two boats because drifting in. You could see that umpire's flag on the way, couldn't you? Because that was a, a drift, a gradual drift out to midstream. Another look at what happened at the start there. On the left-hand side boat. Ooh, yeah. The right blade there, not too bad. They managed to keep going, recovered it, stopped the boat completely. So, yeah, they got away with that one. You know, it is a long course, never give up, always race the line because you never know what can happen. Much as we expected, Y Quad City slightly down in this Jubilee final. You know, it's, it's a tough event, you know, it's not like you turn up on Saturday and have one race and you race a day, it's you know, it's, it's four races over the end of the course. Well, Y Quad Cities have turned it round, haven't they? The Americans now leading the usa boats have taken control after their early wobble for these usa athletes so there's some learning curve could be a trophy on the way because they are now leading marlow rowing club comfortably and now they are really turning the screw here aren't they the americans really, yeah they're really tiny on there now well they've got better and better haven't they across the week and throughout this race. And that's what you want to do when you come to these big events is keep stepping on each round. And they've certainly done that. You mentioned that they've been behind at every marker where today they've led every marker. So with that little incident they had at the start, didn't really put them off. Women's quads, the Diamond Jubilee Challenge Cup heading over the big pond, the trophy this year. And it's, six, it's incredible the age of these girls and the speed they're going. It's really impressive. Incredible. So the Diamond Jubilee Challenge Cup won by Wyquad Cities from the USA beating Marlow Rowing Club. Henley Royal Regatta over the years has seen some fantastic duos. Henley 2020 is going to be remembered for only one combination. Here's Jess and Martin. So back into the club action, Thames Rowing Club on the right of your picture, commercial rowing club from Ireland in the Whitehold Challenge Cup. That is for club fours. 
And apart from this being a fantastic race, there are two great clubs, Commercial and Thames, racing each other. And uh, real experience. This is the quarterfinal of this event. So these crews have come through to the Friday of the regatta. It's early in the morning, just about 10 past 10. Not so many people on the bank watching, but uh, this is a sizzling race. And uh, Thames just corrected their steering coming off the island. And now we see... Thames Rowing Club. Well, that's clear water, isn't it, Jess? Yeah, and the Irish guys look quite comfortable here, sitting a length that would be clear water. But they had been warned for steering early on in the regatta, um, so they've probably got a little bit of that on their mind. But they're steering a pretty straight course here, and slight opening of the back. But you know, if they're connected by doing that, and strong enough to do that, it can work for some crews. Yeah, and. Um... If you had to pick a winner here, you'd definitely pick commercial because they're nice and smooth and fluid. They've got that clear water lead. But I, I think one of the things that Ben Lewis, you know, the, the Thames Rowing Club coach has instilled is, is never, ever give up. And, you know, if you've got that sort of soup side, that a little bit of contact, that's going to give you a bit of heart. There in the middle part of the race, you've still got a lot of racing to do. And uh, that contact is all important. And the Thames bowman, James Palmer, who won the Thames Cup in 2015, who's steering the boat, will just be able to feel and give his crew some heart that they are moving back to a little bit of an overlap. Yeah, and that's the product of a big, big programme like Thames Rowing Club. Won multiple Henleys recently. And these guys are out on the tideway, racing each other day in, day out, trying to get seats in the best boats. And the Wifel wouldn't be their top boat at this event, but you know that they've got that training history through the winter, through the spring, and then then probably used to sitting down on the crew. And this shows they're staying in touch with commercial. Yeah, and of course Irish running is on such a high. They had you know an incredible champ world championships in 2019 with um, Sanita Putspura winning the women's single skulls, the lightweights. Uh, double skulls at the World Championships being won by Fintan McCarthy and Paul O'Donovan. And, you know, it, the, the Irish picked up a silver in the men's double skulls. So you look at the Irish crew and you look at a nation whose rubbing is really on a high. So I think these Irish are going to be able to handle the Thames push at them, even though Thames are moving back. And this is where you see the change. Look at Thames just there. They've just gone up a gear, and it's that point where you come through. There's not many people there between Remnant and Regatta enclosures. It's just you and the trees. And if you're going to make a move, do it now. And Thames really have. Yeah. So commercial rowing club from Ireland still have the lead. And Thames starting to come through. Well, actually, that's Thames, I believe, just there. Thames pushing through. So what have commercial got as we come into the last what, 400 metres of this race. Yeah, and that's really paid off for Thames, that aggressive earlier push, and they've drawn back to commercial. And from this angle, it doesn't look like commercial rowing club are going that aggressively, whereas it cuts to Thames, and they're absolutely ripping their heads off in. They are, aren't they? Really winding the rate up. It's up into the low 40s now. Commercial, Thames, and, you know, look this angle, you can't really tell who's in the lead, steering for Thames Rowing Club, James Palmer looking across at commercial, Ben Lewis, the Thames coach, looking on in the launch. And that's a big, big steering move. That's going to lose them a few centimetres. Commercial sense that, Jess. Big steering there. They know not to mess up, so they've steered to make sure they don't collide, but that could cost them it. But they're still bow ball to bow ball. Yeah, Commercial have just sprinted away a little bit. Commercial just in the lead, or are they coming up to the finish line? You've got about another five or six strokes to go. And you can't tell who's going to win this one, can you? Commercial have found a sprint, tend to find in a sprint as they come up to the finish. Whoa, how close was that? You can't tell when they crossed the line. You can't tell, and they've got to ask the steward on, on, the, on the finish line who's won it, because they don't know in the umpire's launch. Just a, a fantastic race in, in a great event. The Wide Folds always has this really tight race that you get to see, and the spectators are smiling their heads off because they know they've just seen an incredible contest there, and they don't know who's won. So let's 
look at the finish line. Commercial at the top of your picture. Their bows look in front and... Oh. It's Thames by one foot on the surge. That's what it is. On the on the surge it was, on the line, that was a hell of a race. And uh, Commercial led through the early parts of it. But what a great credit to the Thames Rowing Club program. Well, you're joining us for the start of the Prince Albert. This is the university level men's Cox Fours. And you have Harvard University on the top of your screen versus Oxford Brooks University on the bottom of your screen. Two massive rowing programs and they're about to fight it out. Yeah, they really are. And the Prince Albert is uh, a great event to get some really tight contests. The student events are so heavily subscribed at Henley. We see Brooks just taking off their Mitchell in the stroke seat. Winding his crew off against. Now, look at the beef in the three seat of that Harvard crew. Ethan Sader, 15 stone eight, Jess. And, and he's an immense powerhouse of a man. And Brooks weighing in at 13.6, Harvard weighing in at 14.8. And part of that is that 15 and a half stone of Ethan Sader. But uh, at the moment, it's Brooks that are leading. Yeah, you need some big lads in, in the Cox Four, so that you've got to carry along your Cox. It's quite a heavy boat, it's a slower race. Um, you want some beef like that in your boat. Yeah. So that's a nice punchy rhythm from Brooks. Not too much check on the stern. You can see at the end the swirl coming off the back. And, uh, well, two well matched crews in this early part of the race. It was Saturday morning, so half past 10 that this race happened. Crowds haven't quite filled up the bank yet. There's Pieter Quinton from Oregon in the USA. Two Kiwis up in the bowels of the Harvard University uh, Cox Four. Interesting to see that multinational pr program. Lucas Clark and uh, Sam Monkley from the North Island in New Zealand. And uh, Ethan Seder and Pieter Quinton from California and Oregon respectively. So it's a multinational effort for the crew on the far side. And you see that a lot now. There's a lot of um, international flavour to a lot of the American programmes. The big collegiate programmes are attracting a lot of children, kids over there to go and, and compete and, and also study. So it's um, you're going to see it a lot. So Brooks rowing with their fat smoothies, those particular type of blades that are very popular on the Brooks programme. You can see them on the left of your picture with the stripe on the blades. Harvard, the crimson, the famous crimson, and, uh, well, a long-time visitor to Henley Regatta. It wouldn't be Henley without a crew from Harvard. And this is a mixture of their 2V and 3V. That's the second varsity and third varsity eights. Top crew is the one varsity eight, the first varsity eight. They're coxed by, um, by a, a cox from Eton. Um, Edward Brace is their cox, and he is from the UK, and he went over to Harvard to study. And you'll see him now being warned a fair few times. And this is where this race gets interesting. It's close between two crews, and Edward Brace has been really aggressive, and has gone to the middle of the course. And if they were any closer, they might clash blades, but their Harvard crew is still behind the Brooks crew. Yeah, I find that a little surprising, Edward Brace's steering tactics. I don't know why he wouldn't just, you know, take a run along the booms. And uh, maybe he's he's trying to just spice up the Oxford Brooks, put them under a bit of pressure. But he was warned for it. And you can hear the umpire warning him again. Yeah, you'd certainly say Brooks are out there in front. What were you going to say, Jess? I was going to say, if you're in the Brooks crew and the crew next to you is getting warned, that's quite a nice position to be in. You don't want them to be panicked. They're holding on, Harvard. Yeah, Harvard are holding on. Brooks have, well, again, what do they have? About a third of a length, half a length lead. And uh, the lighter crew, well, they're moving out, aren't they? Look at that. that. That's almost three quarters of a length. That's a big move from Brooks at this stage of the race. Trying to break out and get clear water over Harvard. We've been warned for their steering. 
about 550 metres to go. They look cool and calm, Brooks, don't they? They don't look under pressure in their faces. Yeah, and these boys have a, a huge programme, Oxford Brooks. They're, they're not the top guys. The top guys will be going to the ladies in the temple. But um, they're, they're here to kind of prove a point and, and to get through the, as far as they can through the regatta and hopefully win something at the end of it. So these are two pretty quite evenly matched crews. And we can see this now, how close the racing is. You can. And uh, Brooks moving out. Harbour desperate to hang on. Two Kiwis in the bows. Just pushing for everything just to try and get a little bit more contact with the Brooks boat and um, you know I still think Brooks are rowing well enough to win this event yeah I keep saying it they look a bit they look smoother than the Harvard, Harvard crew to, in this race and they look like they're actually moving quite well but saying that look across Harvard have moved back they've moved back about half a length and that is not a nice feeling for the Brooks boys if the Harvard boys have got any more grunt in them, any more sprint, they're going to go right to the bow ball to bow ball. That's where we see, you know, what is the big three man, Ethan Sader, going to show that he's got as they come towards the end of the race. And Harvard moving across again, Jess. Yeah, they're really aggressive in their steering. And I don't know why, because you wouldn't want to be in those dirty puddles. It's not a nice place to be. You'd want to be further towards the booms. Um, but their Cox is using this to their advantage and they're actually moving up on the Brooks boys. Yeah, I think Brooks has still got a decent handy lead, two thirds of a length, probably about 35, 40 strokes to go. And uh, that's what you want to have in a closely fought contest. Brooks keeping smooth, just moving for the finish and the Cox Ed Bracey for Harvard. Well, he can see the Brooks boat, Scott Cockle, the Brooks Cox experience with Molsey Boat Club in this in the Cox Fours event in 2018. It's closing up now, isn't it, Jess? And there they go. There they absolutely go. Their Cox has said to them, if you don't go now, you're not going to go anywhere. And they've squeezed right up on this Brooks crew. That was a big move. Look at them go. They've gone again as well, haven't they, Jess? Look at the jump there coming from the Harvard crew on the far side. The Crimson's really giving it to the boys from Oxford Brooks. And as they come up to the line, oh, that was, yeah, he can't believe that, can he? Lucas Clark, the bowman. Sam Monkley lies back in the boat. Big hand in the air from Ethan Sader. And it cocks four to be a length down with that far to go. Unbelievable. Crazy, crazy turn of speed. Really impressive to see. One of our gems. So we're back for one more race with Yaz Farouk and we've given her a UW race, at least a men's UW race against Yale. Let's start this. This is the ladies challenge plate, which everyone has to explain isn't for a uh, women's cruise. This is the intermediate, the second top tier, uh, the very best university cruise from around the world come and compete for the ladies. Uh, this is 2015. So actually this was before you were at UW, but you were at Henley this year. Yeah, I actually happened to be, I remember watching this race. I was there with Stanford at the time, and we had just been out uh, the day before uh, with a similar start as, that Yale did here by Brown. The magic, I think, for Yale in this case was they are also just coming off of the Harvard-Yale race, which they had won for the first time in I don't know how many years, um, and they won it, uh, they got the lead just like they did right here where they really just attacked. And I remember when they launched it out of the blocks, like just look how aggressive. It's like they're thinking we're gonna try to get ahead and, and control this as early as we can. How difficult is it to get a crew and, and persuade them of the history? Because the UW men's history, I mean, we've all now read uh, Boys in the Boat. That goes back a long way. The history, I call Callahan the curator. He's our men's, very successful men's head coach. Um, this year, they were coming off of their fifth consecutive win at the national championship, which is a record. And uh, um, he, the way that that whole boathouse is laid out, I mean, he takes such great care to make sure that all of the student athletes really treasure and appreciate everything that we've got there. It's just a really pretty amazing place. You have lots of 
uh, races in your calendar that you've talked about Yale having the Harvard Yale race, but UW has the sort of opening weekend, which I think falls in May. Is it early May weekend where you have the Windermere Cup? Yes, it's our ramp up to the Pac-12 championships. And uh, similar to Henley, uh, you're, well, you're always going to face an international crew at Windermere. And the crowd is many, many thousands of people similar to Henley. Um, and the race course goes through what's called the Montlake Cut. And there's a bridge over the Montlake Cut with 250 meters to go. So uh, it's like rowing in a stadium. You certainly, you have that feeling of this Henley crowd, but when you hit 30 strokes from the finish line, not only are you, you know, are the, is the cut lined with people, but they're overhead screaming down at you. And what sort of balance have you got with uh, student athletes between academics and uh, the, their sport? and designing a, a season which is going to start in early May and it's going to run through. You know, Henley can be sometimes an add-on, but a tiring one at the end. Yeah, it's, it's tough because we'll go from Windermere to Pac-12s typically the next weekend. Then two weekends later is the um, national championship and then final exams. And then they go from finals to here and I remember in this year particularly, I, I just can't even imagine the pressure that the guys had on them. You, you are so focused on getting to that end goal and then after it's over, you feel like you need a, a lifetime to recover. And how quickly does the balance of power shift between different programs that are doing well? How difficult is it for you as a chief coach to move those levers? Man, um, you know, when you're talking about these races here with the guys, I mean, I think this was Steve Gladstone's fifth year at the helm for Yale. But if you look at his past success, he had won with Cal, he had won with Brown. He had coached um, the Harvard Lightweights to success. Um, and then Parker was one of these legendary coaches. And, and I think Callahan's right up there, you know. So there are certainly powerhouses right now. Uh, in the men's sport, and here is an opportunity to, to, to see some of them. And now in this strangest of all non-rowing summers, have you got any ideas what socially distanced rowing looks like? Do you pour over the sort of government restrictions and rules and think, uh, when, when can I get an eight out? Because that's what we're doing. Yes, and certainly tracking other countries too to see how they've done it. So... Um, you know, we thought initially we'd be starting in the singles, but I think by the time we get together in the fall, maybe we'll be able to do some some pairs and fours. And I think the key will just be to keep the team generally in the same footprint and not, um, you know, spending time outside of it unprotected. Yaz, look, thank you for your time. I know the time change isn't easy uh, from the West Coast, but... Uh, I look forward, it won't be next year at Henley for you because it'll be, you're aiming for 2022. But at that point, uh, I'll buy you, we'll, we'll have a nice drink. How's that? No more promises. And uh, it'll be great to see you properly face to face. It sounds amazing. And hopefully we'll see you here at Windermere first as one of our guest commentators. That is a date. Very good. We've got our last break now of five minutes. So if you want to get up and stretch your legs and then be back because we've got Mahe Drysdale coming up. See you in five.
So welcome back to Henley at Home. Our last guest today is Mahe Drysdale. Mahe, thank you for joining us. Thank you for putting up with all the time changes. Uh, no problem. It's uh, yeah, a pleasure to be here and uh, obviously not uh, able to be at Henley for real this year. So um, it's nice to, to do it another way. Um, let's start with your race reruns. Uh, this is your grand race from last year. Uh, this is the final against the British. Um, how did this eight come about? Um, yeah, it's a, a good question. I guess um, you know Bondi decided to come back from from cycling and uh, yeah got everyone sort of involved. And I just missed out on uh, making the single, so uh, I thought, well, you know, let's let's give it a go and and um, and see how it goes. The the idea obviously was to try and qualify this boat for the Olympics, what sort of chance did you think you had going in? Obviously with Bondi, as you call him, coming back, the ingredients must have been good on paper. Yeah, like this this crew, um, you know, the, the majority of them are, are the basis of uh, under 23 eight that, that won a couple of um, under 23 titles. So, you know, this, this race gave us a huge amount of confidence uh, going forward, um, you know, unfortunately, well, Rotterdam the, the week after, we, we uh, managed to grab a bronze medal and uh, unfortunately in the end um, weren't, weren't quite able to put it together uh, when it counted at, at qualification. And what sort of challenge, because you were trying to do uh, the single and the eight at Henley at the same time, what sort of challenge was that? What, what reaction did your crewmates have to that plan? Yeah, I think uh, in the in hindsight, it was probably biting off a little bit more than I could chew. Um, I'd been in the single about three times in in the last sort of three or four months, and a few little bursts. And I thought, oh yeah, things are going pretty well. But uh, when I got uh, about 20 strokes into the race, um, I knew I'd uh, made a pretty bad decision. But we we're probably at our lowest point uh, we'd been all year on on the Thursday uh, before Henley. And then we had a couple of really good days and, um, you know, the, the British are a quality eight and, you know, to come out of the blocks and, and lead them like we did and, um, and then just to, to sort of move away through the, the middle of this race, um, you know, it was a, a very, very satisfying feeling and, um, you know, it, as I say, it really gave us a lot of confidence. You, more than anyone, know the challenge of rowing at Henley. Is it different between a single and an eight? Is there a different tactic is there a different uh, set of challenges oh it's it's hugely different and um you know i i, I really enjoyed this uh, race the the course just flashes past um you know the single at henley is is a long race and it's a tactical race and you know it's a very much a sort of gladiatorial style racing where you can really you know um you know watch your competitor you can get into the race you can you can you know have those those tactics um, throughout the race, whereas, you know, in the eight, it's just get out there, go as fast as you can, um, try to get a lead and, and hang on. And, um, you know, in the single, that's not always possible. Are you the kind of guy in an eight who's not saying anything? Is there only one voice in, in, from the Cox or are there other people saying things further up the boat? Um, no, there's a, there's a little bit of chat in the boat. Um, you know, I know uh, for me personally, we, we got to um, just past the, the barrier and I felt we were sort of starting to move, and um, you know, I made a call there that you know, let's let's really really win the race now, and um, you know, that was that was a, a pretty good part of a race when you start rowing away from a crew at Henley, um, and you know, you've got uh, eight other guys in the boat with you, uh, you you have a lot of confidence. And it must be a lovely feeling coming up the enclosures, knowing that it's won and that you're going to get your name engraved on a nice piece of old silverware. Yeah, it's, it's pretty special. You know, the Grand is, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, pinnacle event at, at Henley and um, you know, obviously uh, won the, the single a uh, number of times and, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to be one of the, the people that's, that's managed to win the Grand and the single is, um, you know, was, was pretty special and, you know, it's also nice you've got uh, other guys to, to celebrate and, and share in that success so you know it was um, yeah it was it was it was a pretty magic magic time and um, I guess uh, 
you know, if I never get that uh, that title of of having the most Henley wins in the single uh, to myself, uh, at least I can say uh, I've I've got the grand. I don't think Stuart McKenzie ever got, so uh, I've got one up on him or half up on him, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's not many people who can say they got anything up on Sam, <laughs> Sam McKenzie. We're going to turn our attention now to a New Zealand women's crew in the Hamilton pairs. This, of course, is Prendergast and Gowler from 2017. Um, there's something about the uh, joining together of uh, the men and the women's team that the Brits, certainly from my era, struggled with at the time, and now it's better. Um, and you see what used to be uh, a rowing team in New Zealand that was all about the men's team way back from the 1980s. And now that story is being joined, shared, arguably on occasion even beaten by the performance of the women. What's that been like from the inside of the New Zealand system? Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess it's been great. We're probably uh, more than anyone in the world. You know, we we use each other, um, you know, to to our advantage, and um, you know, we're very proud of of what these these girls have achieved. You know, these these two jumped in the the pair, um, and you know, from from an under twenty three, uh, you know, perspective, they they went on and dominated, uh, and you know, they've they've just been a, a magic combination, and and very much. Uh, Right at the top of our squad now, as as uh, the the leaders and the um, the bench uh, mark setters, I guess of of the crew, and you know they're just just so uh, smooth and and so sort of unflappable. Um, you'll just see, you know, as this race develops, they'll just just keep keep extending that relentless kind of uh, speed that um, you know no one else can can uh, match uh, throughout the race. And there's there's something I think about the New Zealand small boats, particularly watching them over a number of years, about you you don't tend to put a huge amount of energy or what seems like effort into the initial 200 metres, 250 metres, but but it comes very naturally and it's very easy speed, and then and then that speed is maintained against every other boat in the world through the second 250, the second 500, so that almost without anything happening naturally, the lead, just as we're seeing here, the lead begins to open up at an almost unexpected moment of the race. And, and I can imagine it's quite disheartening racing you guys uh, because, you know, it, it's like, well, there's not much we can do if there's only 500 metres of the race. This is our speed and you guys are moving away so smoothly. Yeah, you know, I'd say it's it's not a lack of trying that we um, we aren't quick out of the blocks. Um, I think more than anything, uh, once we go out of the blocks, we don't really slow down, uh, and that's that's really the difference. The other crews can't hold that speed uh, um, through the middle of a race, and and we just just keep that that speed up. And saying that, these girls are probably the first five hundred, um, you know, comparatively uh, to to a lot of crews, and I think a lot of that came from. Um, uh, Heather and Helen, um, you know, sort of setting that that benchmark uh, in in the woman's pair that you know you you got to go out and do it, um, you know, probably a forties, which is um, you know to, to what I'd do in the single, um, and then and then uh, you know try to try to hang on to that. So we've just had a slight technical issue, but Mahe's managed to rejoin us on his phone from New Zealand. Uh, Mahe, I can't think of you rowing in a pair on the international scene. I think you've almost done every other boat, but have you ever done a, an international season in a pair? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, no, that's right. Um, it's something that uh, I, I absolutely love the pair, and uh, it's it's a boat that, that uh, I probably would would pick second to to the single but i guess just the the way opportunity is has happened it, it's never happened and um probably in hindsight through my career the the only regret i have is uh potentially 2004 uh when we we uh sort of prioritized the men's four and so i was in that boat and um you know i, I know uh, our our pair was very close to a medal and uh, you know, Eric and, and I went went pretty well on a pair. So, you know, it would have been nice to uh, to see what what we could do back then. But um, as I say, that that's history and, and never got that opportunity. And um, yeah, probably probably won't get to to race the the pair internationally uh, anymore. 
There have been regattas in the past where it's noticeable that you're pretty much the only New Zealander to come. Is that always a slight discussion with the selectors and the coaches about your priorities in the season and the way that you you want to come in a way that the squad on occasion doesn't come with you? As I say, I love Henley and, and racing is a, a big part of um, of it all to me. So, um, you know, like I, I try to get as much racing as I can and uh, we're there for the two World Cups. Uh, quite often we'll, we'll fit in Hollenbecker, uh, so and then uh, Henley as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm racing for, um, you know, probably three out of out of five weeks. And, uh, you know, it's, it's what I love doing. It's... Uh, and you know, I, I always love the, the challenge and always learn a lot um, you know, in, in all these different formats. So, no, it is, it is great to, uh, to, to be there. What is it like coming to Henley? Because very often you guys as a squad, you're, you're traveling long distances to Europe. Sometimes for you, Henley is the end of the trip. Sometimes it's in the middle. You know, that sort of living out of a suitcase for long periods of time, dealing with the time change when you first come over, that's a whole added dimension to your racing in Europe which we as Brits and others just don't have to deal deal with yeah you get get kind of used to it after a while and you know we quite often spend three months uh, in the summer and um, you know I think all, all of the squad are, are pretty used to that uh, the the bonus of that is we we haven't had a winter I haven't had a winter for 20 odd years and um, this is going to be my first one so so that's going to be a bit tough but I think for all the team and, and you know, the reason that we were there uh, last year is um, you know, a lot of the guys hadn't experienced Henley and uh, we, we really enjoy the, the experience. Uh, it's a, a different sort of racing and I love it, just that sort of step back in time that, that you go back um, you know, and, and you could understand what the regatta was like 100 years ago. So the third race we want to play uh, is a Diamonds final, one of the rarities of you not being there. Uh, this is 2017. So at this stage in your career, uh, you, you'd won that amazing final in Rio, probably the most amazing single skulls final any of us had seen. Uh, and then you had a, a, a year out. Is that the best way of describing it? Yes, um, I, I guess uh, I'd, I'd uh, taken a lot from the family, so it was time to give back. And we had a child... Um, in January uh, of uh, of 2018, so um, oh sorry, 2017 it must have been, and uh, so yeah, that was that was uh, a time for me to go and, and uh, spend some time at home and and uh, look after the family. So you know, this was uh, yeah one of the opportunities I wasn't there, and um, you know, you you see here um, Matt Dunham is is down by quite a long way, um, but. If you've if you've ever raced Matt Dunham, it's uh, you know write him off at, at your peril because uh, he's just a terrier. He just just keeps yapping at your heels, and um, you know he's he's a guy that's that's never going to give you a, a race, and he's never going to give up. Your mindset sitting at home, thinking about you know obviously spending great time with the family. Were you thinking this might be it going into Rio? I, I thought that you know I was done and. Uh, it was probably the the last sort of 18 months that I realised that you know I, I still felt like I was improving and and things were going going pretty well and um, yeah so so probably uh, by the time I got to Rio uh, I was a little bit more uh, favouring continuing but it was actually pretty quick to be honest after after Rio that I decided I was going to continue but I was going to have a year out and um, you know it was it was something that that uh, I, was, I was pretty happy with. And, and certainly after 10 months of uh, being a full-time parent, uh, I was ready to uh, have an excuse to have my, my sleep. And um, yeah, could could sort of, uh, when the baby was crying, I could just prod Juliet and say, I've got training in the morning, so you better get up. You watching this singles race, you know exactly and intimately the difference in the course and the station. And Matt Dunham here is, uh, it's about the only time that you get an advantage on that far station and making the most of it. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, as I say, Matt, Matt is a very, very tough competitor. Um, you know, he's, he's a, a lightweight, uh, so 
Henley uh, being longer and, and slower is is, uh, you know, is is potentially at a disadvantage, but uh, you, you're never you're never going to write him off. And um, you know, when I, I saw that he was he was sort of sticking in this this close, um, you know, through this this race, I thought you know there's there's a good chance because he's uh, he's got a, a very big sprint at the end if uh, if he gets a sniff. And you know, he's a, a quality sculler and. Um, you know, I think I think at this this stage uh, it was it was getting pretty exciting uh, because I knew what Matt can do over that that last uh, you know couple of hundred meters, and he's got a, a real good turn of speed. And how difficult is it on the Henley stretch with the water, with the conditions, with the crowd, with the booms, to scull your best? It must be very difficult to relax. You kind of get used to it during the week because the, I would say the water gets better. Um, you know, on Sunday is, is the best water you're going to get. There's less spectators. Uh, there's, there's less people, um, you know, in, in boats that, that are just cruising up and down. And, you know, if you, you race at about 6.30 on, uh, on a Saturday night, um, that's probably the worst water you're, you're going to experience at Henley. And, um, you know, there is the rogue waves coming and, you know where these gaps are. Just see, he's going past a gap here. Um, you know where those gaps are, and, and just getting ready for uh, you know the, an old wash to come through. But you know that's that's part of the the joys of Henley. You've you've got to be ready for anything. Uh, you never um, you never take anything for granted. I remember one year um, I I did have that race at about 6:30 on a on a Saturday night, and it was about here in the course, and um, there was a, a party going on in one of the boats, and and they uh, they sprayed me with champagne as I, I went past, and you know that's that's one of the great things about Henley. You you never get that close to the spectators. Um, you know if, if you're close to the booms, you can be you know literally three meters away from from the spectators, and there's no no other place in the world that you can row that that spectators will be that close to you. And we were watching the drone pictures there. I remember having an interaction with you in 2015 when the drone was first up because I felt it was really low over your head and sort of buzzing you almost and rushing over to find you afterwards. And you were totally nonplussed about it. You were totally relaxed about it. And I thought, well, if he can deal with it, then, then we're on to a winner. If uh, he's the best scholar in the world is enjoying it and enjoying the footage, uh, then this is going to be great. Yeah, I guess there's so many things to think about, and you can see here Matt is uh, really winding it out at, at the finish line. But I think it's a, a pretty impressive um, thing that Henley's done, and you know what, three years of, of TV coverage uh, have have uh, you know produced one of the, the best productions there is in rowing, and um, you know it just just gets people a little bit more into it with the rowers uh, inside the boat. They can sort of appreciate a little bit more of. Of what's happening and and uh, you know being that close to the rowers, which is uh, you know really a really good good thing for the sport. This is our last record breakers interlude, and this is from 2018. It's the Prince Albert Challenge Cup. The Prince Albert Durham University A crew are on the far side, on the left of your picture. And closest to us, we've got the oarsman from Imperial College of London. This one's a great showdown between two very strong university crews. Wouldn't like to call it. A little bit slicker over there in that light purple, that platinum colour compared to the royal blue of Imperial. It looks bouncy out there, Martin. Got a bit of a bounce in the water. Yeah, there's some of the launches coming down making quite a bit of wash. We now go down past halfway. And they're not, they've not let them slip, to be honest. They're staying in touch with them. Those Durham boys, I tell you what, they know how to train. I went and trained with them. Tough, tough programme. They train up in a tyne, unrelenting, freezing cold winters of training. And these look like four very strong guys in this boat here. Imperial looking right back, look at this. That's sensational. What's happened there? I really, really don't quite understand how, how the Imperial crew could move through so quickly. An incredible move. Guys, look at them. That's got to feel amazing. You're sitting, you can't see the crew next to you, and suddenly, there they are. You've sucked them up and you're spitting them out. 
There they go, and they're moving past. They're actually moving through, and that's a pretty impressive move to the middle of this race. And suddenly, this dome creatures look a little bit heavier. It looked like they've kind of hit the brakes a little bit. I don't understand that move that the Imperial College made. It. No, they've got struck good rhythm. Found their stride. They kept their heads in the middle of that race. That's really impressive to see from this university standard of rowing. I don't know, they look really sharp and bright off, but, you know, I know Imperial probably had a big effort, but they really did move through so quickly in the middle part of that race. They've got to soak this up now, coming down through the enclosures, a few last hundred metres, knowing they're going to the weekend of Henley. Great result. Rode through the Durham University A-Club crew, took that early lead. A very, very impressive middle part of the course. Now, for the final time, it's back over to Jess Eddy and Martin Cross for two of the hidden gems. Thanks, Matt. And here are our last two Attention. hidden gems. And we're taking you to the Remenham 2019 Women's Eights race. You're going to see Leander Club, Imperial College on the right of your screen, which are the senior international women's eight versus the University of London Molesy Boat Club, who are the development under 23 eight. And it's going to be a corker. It is going to be a corker, isn't it? And if you're the under-23s, you love the fact that you're racing the National 8. And uh, we see this happen, you know, on quite a few occasions with the uh, senior and under-23 women, the senior and under-23 men. And, uh, you know, we're never usually disappointed by this matchup. And it puts the senior women under quite a lot of pressure, doesn't it, Jess? It really does, and, and in one way, I've, I've been in that seat and I've raced fast under 23s, and it's really annoying because you've earned your seat in that, in that boat all year by beating these girls, but suddenly a crew can come together and, and it can be really fast. And I've, I've been told by a little bird that these crews both did pieces the week before at Caversham, and the, the coaches kept the results a secret, not to put anyone off, but I know the under 23 team were very, very close to the seniors, so they knew they could take them right to the edge. That's pretty cool. And I think it's really interesting to see that uh, Leander and Imperial College crew on the left of your picture. They're, they're being stroked on bow side by Rowan McKellar. And uh, that's a bit of a strange lineup, Jess. Yeah, so what you see a lot of the time is they use Henley, uh, the national team, to try things out. And they completely change their rig here. They put in a bucket and they, they put Rowan at stroke to be bow strokes. <laughs> and um, they didn't say whether it went well or not, but they changed it after this for the World Championships. And right now, they're getting under masses of pressure from this development in 23-8. Yeah, and it's such a big race, this, for the senior British women, because, you know, they really want to qualify for the Tokyo Olympics, and that was what was at stake in this 2019 World Championships. And this is a race on the row, but you see the under 23s there, Nicole Lamb in the stroke seat, really sticking it, sticking the rhythm down. And uh, there is really not much between these two at all. And the under 23s, you think that they shouldn't be that close. No, but in, in um, retrospect, you can see that that development crew is made up of some outstanding rowers. And you've got people like Una Cousins and you've got Nicole Lamb, who are there. Their, their names are used time and time again for under 23 medals and development team. Um, so this is how they, they learn to row, and they're cutting their teeth by taking on the senior team. And another interesting point in this race, Martin, which I love, is both coxes were in competition with each other. So Morgan Bannon Williams is coxing the development eight, but she had been coxing the senior eight and Matilda Horn is coxing the senior eight. So they were, they were, there was massive competition between these two crews and there's kind of a lot of tension right here in the middle of the Henley course and they're staying in touch. Yeah, and we saw that uh, Morgan Bain and Williams from the UL and Malsey crew at the top of your picture, she got warm for her steering, perhaps trying to be maybe a little bit over aggressive there towards Matilda Horn and the national squad crew, senior crew, just taking it out a little bit there and you would expect them to row away at this point, wouldn't you? You think, well, the other 23s have had a close race. They've, they've led out, you know, we're, we've gone back through them now and they ought to just lay down and die. Absolutely. And you, you want to be, I'd say, to be comfortable, you want clear water. And as much as those girls think they're comfortable now, if you're in the middle of that race and you've got these hungry underdogs and they're in touch, touching distance of you, 
you're, you're going to feel uncomfortable. But two things the, the senior girls have got, they've got Zoe Lee and they've got Karen Bennett, who rode with me in Rio, and they're used to these tough races. And through the middle of that race, I tell you what, they can put the, the, the big guns down. And they're doing that right now. And they're just pushing 23s to almost a length here. I'd say they're doing that a lot on power rather than cohesion. It, it, it's not the sweetest I've seen the, the British eight row. I think, uh, you know, remember that crew at the 2019 Worlds, they look to be rowing a lot better, but uh, power at the back end, I think. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because they've, um, they've put in a bucket here in the four and five seat, and we always joke that if, if, if in doubt, put in a bucket, see if it can change things up. So maybe they were changing things, trying to get more speed, and it, and it hasn't quite gelled them here. And, and right now, the under-23 development team are staying in contact with them. That is not comfortable. No, it's not comfortable at all. And uh, with the Kiwi world champions waiting ahead of them in the final, the winner of this race, it's not going to be an easy ask that to take them on. So you really want to get as much out of this contest as you can. And at the moment, it looks like the under-23s are getting more out of it than the senior team. Yeah, Morgan's telling her girls to go now. What we've seen all day, go now, you can't leave it. So they, they're using that extra bit of mileage and they've started to ramp it up. But at this point here, I do think the senior team look a little bit more comfortable. They're the ones that maybe look in control, another length up, but look at two crews from behind. They've got it by this point. But they've certainly been put through the ringer by this under-23 team. And that's why I love this race. I think that competition is internal and suddenly it's become external at a big race, which we can re-watch. Um, and it's, it's under the magnifying glass. Yeah, I love the fact they kept those internal races secret between the senior and the under-23s as the seniors crossed the line first. But this and the under-23s there take on the seniors and, and, as you say, is in a very public forum. Yeah, and this could have been a big stepping stone for them. It showed them their weaknesses and they built on that and they went and qualified for the Olympics. So hats off to these girls. So we wanted to finish with a Henley final, and this is a great final. Lots of give and take in this race. The lead changes. But really what's fascinating between these two crews, Claire's Court on the right of your picture, Independent School from Maidenhead and Windsor boys, just down the road, is that these were the two crews facing each other in the final of the four league in 2016, where Claire's caught one. So it's a matchup. They're not all the same personnel, but it's really, really going to see quad sculling at its best. Yeah, it's such a high caliber of men's quad sculling in our country, under 23 world champions. And, and this event is a huge stepping stone for these boys to move up into those kind of places. It is. And what's interesting, I think, is Claire's caught the, the crew closest to us. We've just got one lad, Oliver Costley, the bow man. He's furthest away from us from the crew that won in 2016. But the crew on the far side, Windsor boys, have got two lads, Smith and Bryn Ellery, in the stroke seat from that losing crew in the final in 2016. And they've come back with Sherwell and Workman and got a really, really good run through this regatta. And the race before this, Jess, so Windsor boys, I think they came through the Leander Quad and I think the verdict was something like one foot. So that's what the Saturday race. So they've really been put through the mill. But, you know, tremendous confidence to come through and win a race by a foot. And I think they're taking that out early on because Leander led them early on in that semi-final and Windsor boys are taking it out early on from the Clare's Court School. I do like the way the Clare's Court School, they're rowing here. They're very upright. It's, it's classic quad rowing. It's not too much of a backswing. It's very simple with the rock over. And, and quite still, and I think it's keeping them in contact with the Windsor boys on the far side. Yeah, it's all the hallmarks of a Tom Josh crew, isn't it? The uh, famous coach from the Clare's Court School, and he really does know how to make a quad move, as does, to be fair, as does Mark Wilkinson, the Windsor boys coach. But uh, I do like to watch the Clare's Court sort of style of, of uh, crew sculling. It's very loose, very low down. As you say, it's quite an upright style, easy rock over. And uh, Windsor boys taking out, very punchy rhythm, isn't it? Nice sort of uh, pick up the boat and then sweet send off. It looks, you know, quite a high standard of sculling from the Windsor boys 
blades there with the green and yellow distinctive colours. Yeah, I was about to say, two very different um, techniques there. The Windsor Boys boat is almost bouncing in the water, but what they are doing, and if you do that properly, is they're picking it up and delivering it together at the same time. Now, that doesn't work if you're just batting away at it and your boat bounces up and down, but they're picking it up together and that point of max acceleration, they're pushing it forward, and, and that's why they're length up here. But the silky rhythm of the Claire's court boat is actually keeping them in contact. I think there's two differing techniques there. Yeah, and what we've got to see is, you know, Windsor Boys leading out, we've got to see what Claire's Court will have. Will they just wait for the finish? They know Windsor Boys have got a finish because they saw the result of that semi-final against Deander. So, really, this is something that's important that they're going to have to throw in in the middle of the race, just going through the halfway point there at Forley. And uh, Windsor Boys have got a length. Sculling sweetly, quite a high rate of striking, a little higher than Claire's Court. And... Uh, I love that steering straight the way down. That Smith in the three seat steering straight the way down. A really beautiful course. Claire's Court going a little bit close to the booms there. Yeah, a bit of steering. We've not really mentioned about steering that much today, but it, it's it's very, very tight once you're in there. You've got your booms on one side of you and another boat on the other side with an eagle-eyed steward behind you. So it, it it's very different from normal open racing where we have little boys that we just hit. If you hit those booms, you're in trouble. Yeah, now here we go. Clears Court have moved out into the centre of the course, and I think this is the big time for them. They're coming up to Remnant Club, past Upper Thames, still in the middle part of this course, but here is where they need to start to move. They can't leave it to the end. They've got to make a move now, and I think you can see the stroke man, Osborne, from Clears Court really leading his crew, and they're coming right back into this race, Jess. And they really have, don't underestimate, this is the highlight of their entire season and they've got two minutes to go and these boys are giving it everything they've got to get back level and that's what they've just done there. They, the bowman's turned around, the two-man shouted, Remnant, put something in now because we need to stay in contact. Yeah. And they've come right back at them. They're moving back with every single stroke. Windsor boys still got that sweep with them but Claire's caught and moving and moving. And, uh, well, there's something just over 500 metres to go as we pass that signal. And Claire's Court are inching, inching back on Windsor Boys with every single stroke. A look across from the Windsor Boys bowman, Sherwell, that is, in the bow seats. Looking to his left, looking to his right. Look at that margin, Jess, how it's come down. It's amazing. And this is great quad rowing. Both crews are doing great stuff in their boats. And neck and neck, their Henley final, who's going to hold on to it? So Windsor boys have just got the lead, but I think the bows of Claire's Court are going to hit the front. Would you say they're hitting the front just now, Jess? I think it's on the surge. So, you know, each boat, they probably don't know who's ahead. They've got their eyes shut and they're going to go now for the last 300 metres. So, you know, it's everything to play for. Claire's Court have put such a lot of effort to get back into the race, but I think that confidence that Windsor boys took from that row against Leander might come into play now. They're really sweet off the back end, real surge off the back end, Windsor boys. This is where you hit a wall of sound. It's going to be so much shouting and you've got to get your head down and go up in the gears and get your bow ball ahead. Here we go. Oh, it looks a great race, doesn't it? Windsor boys just got the edge on Claire's Court, but Claire's Court could come back if Windsor boys have gone too soon. As they go through to the finish, here it comes, Jess. We saw Harvard earlier on. Can Claire's Court do it? Well, Windsor boys coming up to the finish. Well, that was a margin at the finish, just about three quarters of length. You can see what it means to the Windsor boys, to Sherwell, Workman, Smith and Ellery. Captured really clatty. the... Yeah, they've captured the Fawley, which they lost against the same school last year. And... Uh, Brilliant one to finish. Claire's Court came right back into it. Took the lead from Windsor boys. But they really were ice cool, the lads. That was what took them to that win of the Forley Challenge Cup. Well, that's it for Martin and I and our hidden gems. We're going to go up to Matthew for the final time for Henley at home. So we're back for one more race with Mahe Drysdale. And no surprise that it's the 2018 Diamonds final. Uh... So you've come back from a year away. You're back in the single. Talk about the build-up to this race through the European season. 
while I'd entered Henley, uh, I wasn't sure I was, I was actually going to come. Uh, and it was, it was only in the last couple of weeks that I decided I needed the race after missing the, the World Cup. Uh, and incidentally, I'd, uh, I'd had a training accident the day before I, I flew out um, with my, uh, my boat getting broken in two in Munich. So um, things were um, sort of hadn't, hadn't quite gone to plan. Uh, but this was the opportunity, and uh, you know, this was this was a, a I'd sort of got through to the final, uh, and knew this was was going to be the the race. And obviously, at this point, um, very early in the race, I'm I'm down quite a way, uh, but but I did feel like I was uh, you know I was I was sculling fairly well, um, and and sort of building in into my rhythm, and uh, it was it was something I hadn't I hadn't put together was a, a full 2k. Uh, since I'd, I'd been back, I'd always been happy with, with various aspects, um, and so this was, uh, uh, I guess, needed a lot of a lot of uh, confidence uh, to to be able to go and approach the the following week and and try to do as as well as I could there. And how difficult when you're slightly looking and there's a you can see someone, and then there must be a point after about a length and a half or even two lengths that Kettle Borch has got on you. That if you look, you can't see him, and that must be disheartening <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I hadn't really experienced that. I guess at, at Henley, is is you know being down this far this early, and um, to be honest, at this point, I was uh, you know just just had a, a quick glance around then, and uh, I'm having to look quite a long way over my shoulder to to be able to see him. Uh, I thought, you know, well. Um, this one might have to to wait for another another day because uh, this uh, I needed this to to draw level um, uh, with uh, the record for for diamond wins. So um, you know it was it was something that that uh, I I didn't think was going to happen at, at this point in the race. And Mahe, how important is that history to you? You've talked about the record in the diamonds. Obviously, you get that beautiful pineapple cup uh, to keep forever. How important is it for you to leave that little bit of history as you come and compete at Henley? Yeah, you know, I think you know Henley has such a, a massive history, and uh, certainly um, you know was was something that that uh, it's, it's pretty special to to be in the record books. I even had the barrier record at one point, so um, I think that's that's now been taken off me. But you know those pineapple cups are, are good. Um, you you want to ha- try to make enough to to have a dinner party, so. Um, you know, I was uh, I was a little bit short um, coming into this race, um, and and wanted to at least have a dinner party of six. It would be nice to uh, to get them out to eight, um, but um, yeah, I'm not sure that time's on my side for that. We're uh, going through halfway, and right, the, the the only positive is that he hasn't taken more out of you. Is there a temptation to start? chucking race plans out of the window at this stage and start changing things, start panicking? Um, I think at this point on a Henley course, um, you know, probably other, other courses might be a little bit different, but I knew how long this course was. And, um, yeah, I think I took out of this that, you know, he's, he hasn't extended anymore, um, but he's, he's still a, a heck of a long way in front. And, you know, the, the chances of me catching him uh, is is uh, not not great at this point, but um, unlike the the grand that we watched before, which you know you you can't make up this sort of ground in, in the grand, but in the single and in ten strokes uh, you can you can do a lot of damage. And are you thinking at this stage about when to try something, or are you just trying steadily, or are you going to put it into chunks of ten strokes? Yeah, I think at this point, you know, I, I am starting to build, um, and you know, just knowing that that I've I've got to you know, I've got to stay in touch as, as best I can, and um, it was a, it was around about uh, this point that um, I I could start to hear um, a bit of a murmur, and uh, you know, the the crowd at Henley is is usually very polite, and you get some some polite clapping, and I started to hear a bit of a roar in the crowd, and. Um, that to me, I, d- I didn't even need to look around because I, I thought they're not going to be roaring if I'm as far behind as I was before. So I, I must be starting to make ground, and uh, you can see me me starting to build now. Um, you know that that uh, energy, I guess, and uh, knowing that that uh, you know I've, I've actually got a, a, a chance here um, certainly meant that that I was ready to um, you know to to lay down as as many strokes as I can and and see what was possible. 
And are you noticing the water change behind his boat? Maybe it's still, you're still not overlapping, which is extraordinary to me. There's only 250, 275 meters left. Yeah, you can, you can start to see the puddles um, as you get closer. You can, you can just sort of see them out of the corner of your eye. And about now I can start to see his stern, which I haven't seen uh, for pretty much the whole race. So, um, you know, that, that just gives you, when you're that, that coming from behind like that, um, it can give you a little bit of an extra boost. And as I say, the, the crowd, I've never heard the crowd so loud at Henley. And, um, you know, it certainly, um, you know, made me, uh, made me push a, a little bit harder knowing, um, you know, that, that they were, were now experiencing a, um, a race. And you can see here, he is just, he is just done. And uh, I Go think on. this is the difference between, you know, a, a 2K race and a, you know, 2,100 um, metre race is, you know, you, you just hit that limit. And, uh, you know, this is also into a current. So it's it's a little bit longer than, than what you'd expect over 2K as well. So, you know, it's, it's quite a... a quite a big victory uh, like margin in the end but you can see and uh, he came up and spoke to me afterwards uh, once he'd recovered a little bit and I I have a lot of appreciation for what he put himself through because I've never seen someone you know be able to uh, I guess row through that much lactate and his you know he had bloodshot eyes and he was a broken man and um, that certainly uh, was was pretty satisfying. It just, uh, it, it still, I have to watch it back again and again to realise when you took the lead and as you, as you mentioned how much you won by that, that, the, the it, it, I'm dreading to think about when he thought the game was up because it can't have been very far from the finish. Yeah, I think it was only that, that last 100 metres and, um, you know, I think there's, there's a little bit of an experience at Henley there, but um, you know, there's there's two things. I would have, if he hadn't have blown up like he did, I would have never come through him. Um, but you know, you've you've got to put yourself in that position, and you've got to you've got to put the pressure on. And and sometimes that can uh, can can be the difference. Um, you know, if if you just never give up, uh, you've you've always got a, a chance, especially on a on a Henley course and a single. So let's just bring come up to date because the start of this worldwide pandemic was extraordinary in lots of different ways um but funnily enough uh thinking in with my sports head on one of the people around the world that i thought about was you when when new zealand particularly came out and said ahead of any travel ban we're not going to go uh to the olympics uh what were those days uh and those weeks like when it when it began to hit you know, mentally, I went to a, a, a pretty dark place, and I lost all my motivation. And um, you know, I, I, to be honest, I, I thought that was it for me. Um, I was done. And you know, I'm thankful. I guess I, I you know, force, forcibly didn't make a decision um, because I knew it wasn't the time to make a decision. But um, you know, and, and as soon as we got back on the water. Uh, I, you know, I made the, the decision to continue because, um, you know, it's, it's what I love doing. But, you know, certainly uh, my thoughts are with anyone that, that has lost loved ones or, um, you know, lost their livelihoods because of it. And, uh, you know, it certainly puts, puts rowing in perspective. And, uh, you know, they certainly made the right decision with, with the Olympics and uh, putting, postponing it a year. And I, I guess now we'll just have to see whether, whether they can, can run it, um, you know, in, in 12 months' time. Some great sentiments there. Um, and finally, where where are you with selection and boats? And I mean, the Olympics suddenly is a a year away again. Uh, are are all the pieces up in the air, or have you got a plan? You know, the the goal is to to get to the Olympics and and go and set another record for for being the oldest uh, Olympic uh, gold medalist uh, in the single skull. So. You know, that was, uh, I was going to do that at 41, but now that will be 42. So as we said earlier, that will uh, hopefully make it even harder for, for anyone else. Um, plus I get the bonus of uh, getting an extra year of being an Olympic champion. So, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's not all bad. Very good. Great sentiments. Listen, thank you for your time. Thanks for all your positive thoughts and energy and comments. It's been uh, great spending time with you and uh, we'll love to see you back, whether... On the water looks unlikely, at Henley at least, um, but we'll uh, love to see you in the bar at some point as well. 
Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, certainly look forward to uh, coming and, and enjoying a few more years at Henley, uh, probably from a spectator point of view, which will be great. Thanks, Mahe. Thanks for your time. That's it for Henley at Home Saturday, semi-final day, as would normally be. I don't know about you, I'm off for a nice drink. We'll be back here tomorrow, Sunday morning, for a dream final lineup. We'll see you then. The heritage, the traditions. I definitely found there was a different form of pressure at Henley. The fact that it's one-on-one -on -one with the crowds around makes it very different from any other race we do. I used to love racing here. I love the side-by-side. -side. It's more gladiatorial. Now.